Are you a pro swimmer? Brave enough to take a dip in any ocean or sea? Bad news. There are some places you should avoid no matter how well you swim or dive. Some of these places have dangerous underwater rocks, strong currents and tides. Others are famous for legends about monsters and mysterious creatures. So let's dive into this aquatic horror show. Have you ever heard the word the strid? It's a variation of the word the stride that is used in Yorkshire. And it refers to a narrow section of the river wharf that's so small you could jump over it. But don't be fooled by its size, it's one of the most dangerous spots around. Even taking a step into the water can have dire consequences. The river wharf has a forceful current, and since the strid is so narrow, it's even stronger in that area. The intense water flow has eroded the limestone around the strid, which created hollow spaces much deeper than the rest of the riverbed. Here's the secret. The current has also weakened the banks of the strid from below. So, the ground you're standing on, admiring the rapid flow, is probably just a fragile ledge hanging over treacherous waters. There's no record of anyone who found themselves in the water of the strid and found their way out of it. And the worst part? You wouldn't even guess that this innocent looking stream could be such a danger. So, my advice to you, my friend, is to stick to a safer body of water for your aquatic adventures. If you're looking for a weekend getaway in California, Horseshoe Lake is the spot for you. It's got everything. Sandy beaches, hiking trails, and picnic areas, but wait, there's more to it than meets the eye. This lake has a dark side, namely around 100 acres of dead trees that surround it. And it's not just the trees that have been claimed by this lake. The earthquakes that hit in 1989 and 1990 unleashed carbon dioxide from under the hot magma. The gas seeped out into the air, damaging all the life around the lake. Even now, Horseshoe Lake is just as dangerous as it was 30 years ago. What makes it so scary is that the levels of this toxic gas change randomly. Warning signs that are posted everywhere certainly could give a horror film touch to a fun hike in the woods. In Kauai, Hawaii, there's a group of stunning waterfalls that used to be a popular destination for tourists. Kipu Falls, as they're called, were once the go-to spot for swimming and diving. To get to them, you had to take a long walk along a dirt path until you finally arrived at a breathtaking view of a 20-foot waterfall pouring into a crystal clear pool below. But since 2011, this area has been off-limits to the public. Why, you ask? Well, there have been a lot of accidents at Kipu Falls. Obviously, jumping off the top of the waterfall would be an obvious reason for that. But in addition, there were much more mysterious cases. Witnesses tell tales of swimmers peacefully enjoying the pool at the bottom of the falls, only to be suddenly dragged under the surface. No definite explanation was found to these accidents. The locals believe that the water spirit Mo'o is to blame because it doesn't appreciate being disturbed by loud tourists. There's also a theory of a powerful whirlpool at the bottom of the pool. In any case, guide publishers do not mention Kipu Falls anymore, and trespassing is severely punished. The Samizan Hole, located in the Gulf of Thailand, is the ultimate spot for thrill-seeking divers, but it's also the most dangerous one. With a drop of 280 feet, it's the deepest diving site in the region. But its depth is not the only reason it is considered a place to avoid. The area is a major shipping zone for giant oil tankers. The strong currents around the hole make diving even more treacherous. And if that's not enough, the Samisan Hole is also home to deadly barracudas that could easily attack unsuspecting divers. The water is so murky that visibility is nearly zero making it challenging to spot these aggressive sea creatures. All in all, the Samisen Hole is a breathtaking but extremely hazardous spot that should only be explored by experienced divers with nerves of steel. Let me tell you about New Smyrna Beach, the shark attack capital of the world. If you're looking for a relaxing vacation spot in Volusia County, Florida, you may want to reconsider this beach. The waters around New Smyrna Beach are teeming with fish, which attracts a lot of sharks. In fact, there have been so many shark attacks reported in this area that it's earned the title of the shark attack capital of the world. 
even scientists have warned that if you go for a swim there, you're bound to get up close and personal with at least one of these creatures. We are talking about a distance of 10 feet, and in many cases you wouldn't even notice it. To make matters worse, the bull shark, one of the most dangerous and aggressive types of sharks, has been spotted in these waters. Once again, Kauai is on our list. The beach on Nepali coast called Hanakapiai Beach might look like heaven on earth, but don't be fooled. To get there, you have to trek through a super steep, rocky two-mile trail. There are no lifeguards on this remote beach, so even if you decide to take a dip in the water, you're on your own. The biggest threat to your safety is the incredibly strong rip currents. They are almost always present because there are no reefs to shield the shore. And if someone gets caught in one, there's no safe place to swim to for miles. The nearest safe beach is six miles away. Trust me, this beach doesn't have the best track record in terms of safety. So it's highly advised that you stay out of the water if you end up at this beach. Let me tell you about a place that looks like it's straight out of a horror movie. We're talking about Berkeley Pit, which is an artificial lake situated in Butte, Montana. The first thing you'll notice about this place is that it has an eerie blood-red color that can only be described as unsettling. You might be tempted to take a dip, but that would be a grave mistake. Don't even touch it. The water is extremely dangerous due to the heavy metals present in it, such as cadmium, arsenic, zinc, lead, and copper. They come from the rocks that surround the lake and make the water super acidic. In fact, this place used to be an open pit copper mine, hence its color. So if you want my advice, avoid this place like the plague. There are three lakes in Africa that maybe are the most dangerous places of all that I have mentioned so far. They're all located in Africa. Lake Monoon and Lake Nyos in Cameroon and Lake Kivu in Rwanda are all like ticking timers ready to go off. They were formed over underground pools of molten rock and sometimes this molten rock releases toxic gases like methane and carbon dioxide right into the water. When this happens, the gases can build up until they suddenly burst out of the water, creating massive waves that can wipe out everything in their path. This type of outburst is called a limnic eruption, and it can release a cloud of poisonous gas that can be harmful to everything in the vicinity. The most terrifying part? These explosions can happen at any moment with no warning. So if you ever find yourself near one of these lakes, you'd better be on high alert because you never know when the next accident might happen. Maybe you know other places you wouldn't recommend for a fun swim? Share your anti-recommendations in the comments below. Have you ever seen a sea cucumber lying on a bed of sand and thought it looked like a blob? Well, these creatures may seem squishy and defenseless, but they actually have some fascinating strategies to keep themselves safe. Biologists uncovered chemical compounds with the help of which sea cucumbers protect themselves from predators and even from their own toxins. And guess what? These compounds might be useful for human health. When sea cucumbers feel threatened, they can expel thread-like parts of their bodies. These tubes immobilize predators in a sticky, toxic embrace. The toxicity comes from some chemical compounds commonly found in plants. Interestingly, these chemicals are much less common in animals, but sea cucumbers have evolved to use them to their advantage. The substances are also known for their antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. They're already used in a bunch of industries, like cosmetics. But using these chemicals as a defense creates a big problem for sea cucumbers. They need to avoid damaging themselves with their own toxins. It means their own cells can't contain cholesterol, the target that the toxins bind to and pierce. Instead, sea cucumbers have developed two kinds of cholesterol alternatives. It's a self-defense strategy, you see? If you can produce these toxic substances, you have to be able to not make yourself sick. Smart and cute as they are, now you know not to touch a sea cucumber should you ever stumble upon one at the beach. 
Speaking of things you should avoid at the beach, let's move on to the marbled cone snail, a creature so unique and dangerous that it'll make your head spin. This one is quite the world traveler. It can be found all the way from the southern tip of India to Okinawa, Japan, and southeast to New Caledonia and Samoa. That's quite an impressive range. And it's not just where it's found that's interesting, it's how it hunts. This snail may be small, but it's a fierce predator. It loves to chow down on other snails and sometimes even its own kind. When it's hungry, it'll stick out its long white tooth and shoot a poison-laden harpoon at its prey. And if that doesn't do the trick, it'll attack its prey multiple times over, just to be sure. Talk about determination, right? Once the harpoon hits its mark, the prey becomes immobilized and its muscles begin to relax irreversibly. And when the prey is helpless, the snail can begin to munch on it. Where can you find this fearsome creature, you might ask? Well, it's found in fairly shallow waters, typically on coral reef platforms or lagoon pinnacles, as well as in sand, under rocks, or among the seagrass. Watch your step the next time you're out for a swim, just saying. On the bright side, did you know that this snail's venom is being developed as a potential treatment for pain? Some of the chemicals found in this substance have been studied, and they're showing promise. Who knew that this unusual predator could have a softer side too? Next on your list of creatures to avoid should be a little fish called the stonefish. Now you might think this sounds like a cute little pet rock, but let me tell you, it's not to be messed with. In fact, it's the most venomous fish in the entire ocean. These guys are masters of disguise, blending right in with their surroundings at rocky or muddy bottoms of marine habitats in the Indo-Pacific region. They're like the ninjas of the sea, waiting patiently for their prey to swim by before swiftly attacking and swallowing it whole. But here's the thing, you could easily swim right by a stonefish without even realizing it's there. Now, I know what you're thinking. I don't want to accidentally step on a stonefish. And trust me, you really don't. These guys have a lot of spines lining their backs, and they release venom when they're stepped on. Ouch! That venom can cause terrible pain, swelling, and damaged tissues. Not exactly a good day at the beach, if you ask me. But don't worry, the stonefish isn't out to get you. It uses its spines defensively, not offensively. So, as long as you're not disturbing it or stepping on it, you should be fine. Just be careful where you step and maybe invest in some water shoes. And if you do happen to get stung, seek specialized attention immediately. It's best to always look where you walk, shuffle your feet along the bottom to avoid stepping directly on the fish, and wear water shoes when you're in an area that could be home to stonefish. Have you ever had the pleasure of meeting a lionfish up close? They're such beautiful creatures with all those colors and fins that look like wings and accessories. It's easy to be mesmerized by their elegance, but don't be fooled by their stunning appearance. They're not to be messed with. In fact, they're one of the most dangerous fish in the ocean. If you get stung, you'll experience a lot of pain maybe even some allergic reactions. Lionfish inject venom through their needle-sharp dorsal and pelvic fins. They're not aggressive and won't sting you out of the blue, but they will act in self-defense if provoked or caught. It's not just their venom that makes them dangerous. They also have tiny teeth. But instead of using them to bite predators, they have something even more dangerous, their fins. The lionfish uses these spine-like fins to ward off predators. And unfortunately, that includes humans. So, while it might be tempting to swim up close to a fish and say hello, beware of its sharp spines. But here's the thing. Lionfish can be eaten. Some say they're actually quite delicious. And since they're a threat to reef ecosystems, human consumption is encouraged. Just make sure you remove the venomous spines first. If you're snorkeling or swimming near the corals in the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean, you might encounter these stunning fish. 
Keep a reasonable distance between you and the lionfish, and they won't feel threatened or startle enough to sting you in self-defense. Sea urchins might also cause some trouble if stumbled upon. Don't worry, they won't be jumping off the reef and flinging spines at you. They're not aggressive at all. These creatures are everywhere, from rocky shores to coral reefs, and are quite common in almost every body of salt water, including all of the world's oceans. So it's not surprising that sea urchin injuries are pretty common too. But hey, accidents happen, especially when we're distracted by a cute little turtle or too excited about exploring a new dive site. Now, let's talk about their defense mechanisms. These little guys have two ways of defending themselves, their spines and these tiny jaw-like structures that can inject a painful substance. Some species have long, sharp spines that can easily pierce even a thick wetsuit and lodge deep in your skin. Yikes! But don't worry, avoiding sea urchins is not rocket science. Just try to maintain a good awareness of your surroundings. Watch out for protruding spines in the sand and control your buoyancy. It'll help you stay at least a few feet away from corals, which may conceal urchins in their crevices. And if a shore entry has many urchins, pick a different dive site, no biggie. Now let's talk about first aid for sea urchin stings. Soaking the area in hot water for up to an hour and a half can break down the dangerous substance and alleviate the pain. Carefully remove the spines with tweezers and shave the area to remove those pesky spikes. Then wash the injured area with soap and rinse with fresh water. Apply topical creams if you have any in your beach bag too. And of course, watch for signs of allergies and contact a specialist immediately if you notice something weird. But hey, let's not forget that sea urchins are just one of many hazards of the deep. There are bearded fireworms, pufferfish, and fire coral too. So let's not be too hard on our little urchin friends. After all, compared to some of these other creatures, they're pretty tame. So, you've just finished your sightseeing tour of Edinburgh, Scotland, or Scotland. It lasted just under an hour, and you're hungry for more. You ask your guide if there's anything else to see, and they start talking about a mysterious underground city. You ask how long it takes to get there, and you're shocked by the guide's answer. You're standing on it. It's right under your feet. South Bridge? But you were just there and didn't notice a giant arrow pointing down. Hmm. So this is where the mystery starts. The story begins in the mid-1700s. The Scottish capital wasn't as big as it is today. Only 60,000 people lived around Edinburgh Castle. All of them were packed inside medieval walls. And they say today's cities are overpopulated. Get a load of the living conditions back then. The buildings were tall, so there was little natural light. Some houses had 14 stories. Cows walked the narrow winding streets and left stuff. Things were so bad that the famous English writer Daniel Defoe noted, I believe that in no city in the world so many people have so little room. Yep, that's the guy who wrote Robinson Crusoe. Well, something just had to be done. The solution was to build two long bridges to the north and to the south of the city. The names they gave the bridges were more descriptive than colorful. The bridge to the north was completed first. In 1785, construction on the second bridge got underway. It was going to connect the main pedestrian street in the north with the university buildings in the south of Edinburgh. But don't think of this construction as a modern bridge over a river. It was more of a viaduct, a type of bridge that connects two hills across a valley. The word viaduct comes from Latin, as Romans were pioneers in building these structures. Their capital was built on seven hills. And just to be copycats, Edinburgh also straddled seven major hills. Only two are visible today because the city has been built up. Now, back in the 18th century, the construction of the South Bridge was a remarkable feat of engineering. It took the builders only three years to complete it. Nineteen stone arches spanned a chasm that was 31 feet at its deepest point, and the length over a thousand feet. Impressive, even for today's standards. 
But what does a two and a half centuries old viaduct have to do with an underground city? Well, it is the city. You see, they designed Southbridge to be hollow on the inside. As you walk along this street today, there is actually a huge human-made cave beneath your feet. The popular name for this set of chambers is the Edinburgh Vaults. But what was the purpose of this space? And is there something or someone there now? Well, let's take it one step at a time. The builder's original intention was for these vaults to serve as merchant shops. At first, it worked out fine. Merchants used a total of 120 vaults as shops and warehouses. There were workshops, cobblers, and taverns. But as time went by, a major design flaw came to light. The stone was leaking, and the vaults were damp all the time. There was even flooding. The builders forgot to waterproof the structure. The merchants feared the water would damage their precious goods. After just a couple of years, the first tenants started moving out. Once legal trade moved away from the vaults, the city's poor moved in. And not only them, but all sorts of shady characters. Historians don't know much about this period, since there are no written records. But even the squatters had to leave soon. If you couldn't do business in these vaults, how could you live in them? It was damp and cold, and there was no ventilation, sanitation, or natural light. It really stunk. Every real estate agent's worst nightmare. Just 30 years after their completion, the Southbridge vaults were abandoned once and for all. But at a street level, business was as usual. The officials decided to fill the vaults with rubble for security purposes. Buried and forgotten, the memory of a once teeming merchant quarter of Edinburgh slowly faded from people's minds. Now, this is where the story gets a bit weird. During the 1980s, a Scottish rugby player accidentally found a tunnel leading into the vaults. The athlete didn't waste any time and started excavating the vaults with the help of his son. Several tons of rubble and, a decade later, the Southbridge vaults have been restored to their former glory, so to speak. They were again dark and damp, as they were back in the 1700s. There were many interesting finds in this underground city. The vaults were littered with oyster shells, which were the standard diet for a working-class resident of Edinburgh at the time. Other finds, such as shoes and empty bottles, suggested that people actually lived in these claustrophobic vaults. Think of this the next time you see someone trying to rent their garage as an apartment. So, your guide was right. There really is a hidden city under the streets of Edinburgh. Well, at least one street. You have now gone down from the main pedestrian street into Cowgate. You look up and there it is, the only visible arch of the once impressive bridge. You are now searching online to book a tour of the vaults. You just have to see this place with your own eyes. But the Scottish capital isn't the only city with a mysterious underground. The historic region of Cappadocia in central Turkey hides no less than 36 cities beneath the ground. The biggest and the most impressive one wasn't discovered until 1963. It was built during the Byzantine era to protect the local population from invaders. We have similar structures made out of concrete in our cities, but the level of the Turkish underground city is really impressive. There are several levels, like in a multi-story car garage. The caves and tunnels lie 197 feet underground. That's two-thirds of the Statue of Liberty's height. The city could house 20,000 people at any given time, complete with livestock and food. Mmm, the smell. Anyway, 20,000 is the average attendance at Major League Soccer matches today. You might want to add a field trip to one of these places the next time you go to Turkey. Most of these cities in Cappadocia can be found in rural areas. Makes sense, right? After all, they were dug out as hiding places. But in Europe, there is one city whose underground labyrinth resembles the vaults of Edinburgh. You've probably heard of Pilsen in the Czech Republic. But hold on a second. This isn't going to be a story of the most famous local product. Something brewed, perhaps? It's the story of a medieval city that survived underneath the streets of Pilsen. Water wells, cellars, and passageways stretch for more than 12 miles. 
Merchants and craftspeople used Pilsen's historical underground for storage. Water, food, ice, you name it. The waterworks are pretty impressive. Historians estimate that 360 wells are located under Pilsen's historical town center. In times of instability, the passageways served as safe havens for the locals. They definitely didn't go thirsty down there. Today, most tourists visit these mysterious underground cities. But in Canada, there's one where people live and work. The construction of Montreal's underground city began in 1962. The initial idea was to shelter traffic. That's a nice way to say that city officials were building a metro station. The idea caught on, and the project expanded. Now, it's a real-life urban maze hidden under the downtown area. Need a place to stay? There are hotels down there. Want to grab a bite? Step into one of the underground restaurants. Multiple shops, a library, cinemas, the list is long. There are even residential complexes. But how can people live under the ground? Simple. Although the city itself lies beneath the earth, the access points are at ground level. You can enter the 20-mile-long tunnel network at more than 120 places. Oh, that's another place down under. Oops, sorry, Australia. At the beginning of the 20th century, somewhere off the coast of West Africa, a German steamship was leaving the port. Suddenly, the weather got worse, and the vessel entered a thick fog. The sailors ran aground on a sandbank close to the shore. Luckily, no one was hurt, and they were even able to save their precious cargo. But the ship was stuck in the sand for good. And it was not alone there. Nearly the entire length of the western coast of Namibia is called Skeleton Coast. If the name sounds scary, that's because it is. This 976-mile-long beach line is among the most dangerous places on Earth. The local Bushmen tribes believe that their supreme deity made this land when it was angry. The Portuguese were the first Europeans to set foot in Namibia in the 15th century. And yep, they didn't like Skeleton Coast either. Portuguese explorers thought this land presented the gates to the underworld. This is the place where the Namib Desert meets the Atlantic Ocean. It might be dangerous, but it's actually beautiful. Plus, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. If Skeleton Coast had a PR manager, they would quit on the first day on the job. The area is not exactly tourist-friendly because of its geography and history. Beneath the sand and the waves, there is a secret ocean currently lurking for unsuspecting sailors. It's called Benguela Current. It flows towards the north along the coast of southern Africa. This part of the Atlantic is rich in marine life, but the current's land neighbor isn't that happy with the deal. This arid climate created the Namib Desert, one of the driest regions on Earth. And that marine life I just mentioned? It's sharks. 11 species of them to be exact. And yes, the great white decides to pop by once in a while. So far, we've got a desert landscape, strong currents, and sharks. Not a place for a beachside resort, definitely. But if someone ends up on Skeleton Coast, will they know they're in danger? Don't worry, they will. The beach is littered with wrecks of all sizes and shapes. If you remember that German ship I mentioned in the very beginning, its massive and rusted stern is now sticking out from the desert sand. There are some 500 wrecks in total scattered along the coast, and it's a mixed crowd, from Portuguese galleons centuries old to ships that ran ashore here in the 21st century. A modern fishing ship called Zela India managed to slip from its tow rope in 2008 and ended up on Skeleton Coast. Okay, it didn't escape on its own, it had some help from the elements. But it's better to be a tourist attraction on a beach than to be broken up for scrap. That's where the trawler was originally going, poor thing. Skeleton Coast's most famous inhabitant, to call it such a place, is the wreck of the Dunedin Star. The British cargo liner ran aground here in 1942. The massive rescue operation that followed reveals why it's so dangerous for sailors to end up here. The rescuers managed to save all of the crew and passengers but at a heavy price. An aircraft and a tugboat were lost in the process. It took the last of the rescuers a full two months to return home to Cape Town. 
Why, you might wonder? One look at the map of the region reveals the reason. It's an endless sea of yellow, which is the sand. There are so few roads here, so Skeleton Coast is hard to reach by land. There are also legal obstacles. You need a special permit to drive into the area. But the skeletons in the name of the area don't only refer to ships. They also stand for animal bones. Most of these belong to whales and seals. Many animals have adapted to the area, so lions and hyenas roam the coastline in search of a meal. Yeah, now there are hungry lions as well, as if those sharks weren't enough. Other animals with a temporary residence on Skeleton Coast include elephants, cheetahs, leopards, and giraffes. In 1971, the Namibian authorities established a national park here. But except for surfers, after an adrenaline rush, they don't get many visitors. You can understand why. The Namib Desert is the oldest desert in the world, and it's not very tourist-friendly either. Those who travel to the region should pack sunscreen and a warm winter jacket. A weird combo, right? Well, not so much when you think that during the day, temperatures soar over 110 degrees Fahrenheit. At night, the air temperature drops below freezing. What a climate roller coaster! And that's not the final danger. Yep, there's more. Remember how that German ship got lost in thick fog? Yeah, it wasn't a one-off event. Because of the region's climate, fog shows up frequently. Sailors should cover their ears now, but this fog is actually good for wildlife. This is their only source of water in the Namib Desert. Reptiles and mammals have adapted to the harsh climate. They use as little water as possible. Shifting sands, thick fog, strong currents, lions, and sharks. Not the stuff you would put in a tourist booklet. But Skeleton Coast isn't the only beach on Earth you wouldn't want to spend your vacation on. I will take you to Cape Tribulation in Australia. The area covers some 48 square miles in the northwestern part of the continent. And no, the area is not as dry as Skeleton Coast. It's part of the Daintree Rainforest. You could say that here, it is the rainforest, not the desert that meets the ocean. The beach at Cape Tribulation is straight from a postcard. But looks can be deceiving. Hmm, Australia? Probably sharks. No, crocodiles are out here to get you if you decide to go for a dip in the sea. There are saltwater crocodiles that the locals call salties. Well, that's a cute nickname for such a dangerous reptile. And it's not just them. The wildlife seems to have a beef with visitors. From October to June, the waters around Cape Tribulation are full of box jellyfish. Their venom affects the human cardiovascular system. When touched by a jellyfish out at sea, swimmers won't have enough time to reach land for help. Vinegar helps neutralize the sting, so you might want to keep a spare bottle in your luggage. Crocodiles and jellyfish sound dangerous, but there is one more animal you should look after. It's the wild boar. It might sound funny, but you won't laugh when you're being chased by one of these across the beach. 21 million wild boars live in Australia. They're mostly active at night, making it even more dangerous if they charge at you. The best defense is running in circles. Wild boars can't cut corners well. That's probably why we don't see many of them taking up careers as race drivers. Cape Tribulation has one last danger installed for you, and it's not an animal. Out here, even the trees are plotting against visitors. The stinging tree got its name for a reason. If you try to pick one of its beautiful red berries, it'll fight back. Its prickles are like tiny glass shards. The less than pleasant effect on your skin will last for a month. Then there is this wait a while bush. Who keeps naming them like this? This long vine has spikes that grab hold and just don't let go. They are so strong, they can pull a human off a horse. You'll have to wait for someone to come by and save you from this thorny grabber. If you are about to cross this Australian beach from the vacation list, hold on for a second. Tourism is booming here. The local authorities have restricted access to all of the danger zones. Visitors go swimming in dreamy water holes that are surrounded by lush vegetation. There are even ropes to swing from. Now, that's a beach you can finally relax on. Hi there. Have you ever wondered why birds tend to fly in circles? It's because of thermals. 
Now, a thermal is like a big bubble of warm air that rises up from the ground. Have you ever flown a kite on a windy day and watch it go up and down? Well, imagine if the wind was warm instead of cold, and instead of a kite, you were a bird or a glider. So yeah, that warm wind would be a thermal. Thermals occur when the sun heats up the earth, and the air close to the ground gets warm and starts to rise. This creates a column of rising air that birds and gliders can ride on to go up into the sky. Just like how you use the wind to fly a kite, birds can use thermals to soar without flapping their wings too much. They can circle inside the thermal and go higher and higher without using up too much energy. Those that especially tend to use this flying in circles mode are large raptors, such as hawks, vultures, and eagles. When these birds circle in the sky, it looks like they're just hanging there. But nope, it's all about thermals again. It helps them because as they go higher without getting tired, they can look for food more easily or watch out for predators from a good position in the sky. Thermals are important for some other animals that fly too, like insects. You may see lots of birds flying in circles together. Sticking together helps them save even more energy. Some birds, like geese and ducks, tend to fly in a V formation to save their strength. What's interesting is that all the birds in the flock take turns leading the V. As they fly, the birds at the front get tired, so they fall back, and another bird takes their place as the leader. This way, every bird gets a chance to rest and save energy. Thermals can also create powerful storms, like thunderstorms. And sometimes, when you see birds flying in circles or a V-shape, it's because they sense a storm is coming. This happens because bad weather comes hand-in-hand with low pressure. Low-pressure systems are areas in the atmosphere where the air pressure is lower than the surrounding areas. When the pressure drops, it can cause the air to move and create wind. If there's enough moisture in the air, the low pressure can even cause thunderstorms, heavy rains, or even hurricanes. Migratory birds are often those who use their keen sense of hearing and vision to detect changes in weather conditions. When a storm is approaching, There can be changes in air pressure, wind speed, and temperature, which can affect their behavior. Some other animals have interesting types of behavior when the bad weather is coming, too. Cows and other livestock may huddle together in a group for warmth and protection during a storm. Also, cows are known to lie down in a field before a storm as a way to ease this discomfort. Or at least that may be something you've heard. So, what have you heard about this herd? While the belief is that cows predict the weather and lie down because they can feel a drop in air pressure that comes with an approaching storm. But science hasn't confirmed it yet, since there's not enough evidence to support this idea. Cows do like to lie down from time to time, but they do it for a variety of reasons, such as to rest or ruminate. So when you see one lying down, you can't be sure it's because bad weather is coming. Different studies show different results. One found out cows didn't show any significant changes in behavior before the rain, while another study found that cows stood up more often as the rain was coming. Apparently, no one has actually asked the cows about this, but the cows aren't talking, which is why this point is moot. Amphibians, such as frogs and toads, can give us information about natural phenomena. When you hear frogs croaking louder and longer than usual, it might indicate that a storm is approaching. Frogs are sensitive to changes in humidity and air pressure, and they tend to become more active and vocal just before a storm. And when it comes to toads, research says they might even predict earthquakes. This is because before an earthquake, there are changes in the chemistry of the ponds where toads live. The shifts in the ground causes these changes, which in turn causes the toads to flee their homes. Scientists believe we should study these patterns to predict earthquakes more accurately. Meanwhile, dogs can sense storms and thunder too. They feel changes in the air pressure in the atmosphere. Plus, they have a way better sense of hearing and smell than humans. When a storm is approaching, you can spot certain things in their behavior. For instance, they may become more restless or clingy. They may pant excessively or pace back and forth, and they may try to hide in a safe place. This is because dogs can feel the static electricity that builds up in the air before a storm, and they may become anxious or frightened by the loud noises and bright flashes of lightning. 
There were stories that dogs can predict earthquakes, too. But there's no firm evidence of that. But who cares? Dogs are our heroes even without that. Now, honeybees can sense changes in pressure and humidity levels as well. So they use this information to predict when a storm is coming. These are social insects that live in large groups in hives or colonies. That's why predicting weather is so important for them. They need to protect their hives and forage for food before the storm hits. So for bees, bad weather may come like a real vacation they've wanted for so long. Just some chilling and eating all the food they've gathered before. Just like me, in a sense. Spiders have superpowers when it comes to weather, too. Well, they can't exactly predict the weather, but their behavior can give us a clue about temperature outside. When it's going to get colder, spiders might seek shelter indoors. So, if you see many spiders in your home, it could be a sign that colder weather is on the way. You may have heard snakes can predict earthquakes. The legend where this belief started actually dates back to 373 BCE, when snakes and other creatures are said to have left the area before a major earthquake in Greece. Cool story, but there's little firm evidence to support the theory. Scientists do acknowledge that snakes and other animals can sense earthquakes a few seconds before people do, because they can feel the initial wave better. But it's still not clear if they can detect it days in advance. How about sheep and their sixth sense? It allows them to predict rain or snow. They huddle together tightly before a storm, which could be a way to keep warm or protect themselves from the weather. But this theory needs to be yet appropriately tested and proven. You will hear wolves howling during big storms as well. Many people think wolves do it when a full moon is outside. But some experts believe the change in air pressure that comes with a big storm may cause discomfort in sensitive canine ears. And this is what makes them howl. But again, it's hard to tell precisely because wolves howl for many reasons. They do it to signal danger, attract a mate, and communicate with their pack. There's also no evidence the full moon fascinates them so much that they feel the urge to howl when they see it. But it's good for the movies, though. Sharks have ears sensitive to changes in air and water pressure that usually occur during hurricanes and tropical storms. Some experts believe they can detect these and quickly dive into deeper waters to stay safe. Studies show sharks behave like this many times before storms. Again, no one's sure 100% about this, but like many other animals, they do have a special ability to detect changes in their environment and use it to survive and thrive over time. Earthquake lights are some of the most mysterious natural phenomena. They can show up before, during, or after an earthquake. They're usually white or blue and last for a short time, but sometimes they can last up to 10 minutes. It's hard to study them because they can happen at different distances from an earthquake center. We know that they only happen during powerful earthquakes that have a Richter scale rating of 5 or higher. Scientists believe they may be caused by the release of ionized oxygen that occurs when certain rocks break apart. This next weird phenomenon is not spontaneous, but it doesn't make it any less impressive. You'll need to head over to La Macarena, Colombia to see it. It's called the Liquid Rainbow or the River of Five Colors. Here, you can see the river change colors from red, yellow, green, and purple, depending on the light and water conditions. This amazing sight is caused by a very talented aquatic plant. It attaches itself to the rocks in the river and gives the water a reddish color. The water is also very clear, with very few particles floating in it, making the red pigments show even clearer. Should you ever reach this amazing destination, you'll also meet diverse fauna hanging around the lake. Red macaws can be seen at this location as well as howler monkeys. Every fall and spring, a magnificent natural phenomenon takes place in the Wadden Sea region in Northern Europe. Approximately 1.5 million starlings flock at the same spot to rest in the tall grass for the night. However, before the night settles in, the starlings may be surrounded by hungry birds of prey. 
This creates a mesmerizing dance as the starlings form intricate patterns to escape from the birds of prey. This spectacle is referred to as the black sun and involves thousands of millions of birds flying in formation. The reason for their synchronized flight is that it makes it more challenging for predators to single out and capture some of the starlings. Volcanic sounds, also called volcanic acoustics, can happen before an eruption. They come from magma getting pressurized in cracks and pipes, bubbling explosions, and hot water systems near the surface of the volcano. As the magma rises, gas builds up and cracks the surface open. The gas-rich magma creates a sound like a pipe organ, which is known as a volcanic tremor. The sound changes over time, resembling a natural concert. A volcanic tremor is a sign that an eruption is coming. So it's best to seek shelter if you hear anything unusual near a volcanic site. One of the most surreal phenomena to experience on Earth is near sand dunes. Should you ever be at the top of a sand dune, you may be lucky enough to hear one of the strangest things, singing sand. The truth is scientists have yet to fully understand why this phenomenon occurs. One theory claims that the sand might produce this sound while sliding down the dunes because of the friction between its grains. But how can you recognize whether what you hear is singing sand? Well, it's similar to an airplane flying in the distance. One of the few places on Earth where sand makes such a loud noise that it can actually be heard by tourists is in the Namib Desert in Africa, or in the barking sands of Hawaii. To see a rare golden waterfall, you'll have to drive to Yosemite National Park, more precisely, to the Horsetail Falls. You will need to plan your trip ahead of time to make sure you get there either in the winter or early spring. It's the only period of the year when this beautiful sight can be spotted. Let's be clear, it's not real gold falling down the mountain. Actually, it's an optical illusion. When at dusk, the sunlight hits the waterfall in such a unique way that it makes it look like a river of lava or gold. In a California national park called Death Valley, there are some rocks that seem to move on their own and leave trails behind. Scientists thought the roadrunner bird could be responsible for these movements, but this creature is too small to drag rocks around. They also thought it could be the wind, but the rocks are also too heavy to be blown away. Scientists have been studying the rocks for years. But until 2014, they hadn't actually seen the rocks move. They'd just seen them in different positions at different times. With the help of time-lapse photography, they discovered that the movement was caused by a combination of rainfall, rapid temperature changes, and a bit of wind. When it rains, the water sometimes freezes and the rocks get stuck in the ice. As the temperature rises, the ice starts to melt and move slowly, dragging the rocks with it. The traces left behind solidify under the heat of the sun. The ice sheets that move the rocks is very thin and evaporates quickly which is why it was difficult for scientists to understand this phenomenon. Have you ever heard of a dirty thunderstorm? Buckle up, because I'm about to take you on a wild ride through the world of volcanic lightning. No, it's not a new dancing technique, although that would be pretty impressive. It's just a funky way of saying lightning and thunder during a volcanic eruption. When a regular thunderstorm happens, positive and negative particles collide and create a big spark of lightning. And the rumble you hear? That's just thunder. But when a volcano starts to holler, some ash particles get electrified and start colliding with each other. This causes electrical discharges, making it look like there's lightning coming straight from the volcano. And with all the ash, smoke, and gas flying around, it looks like something straight out of a sci-fi movie. That's why it's sometimes called a dirty thunderstorm, too. Whoa! Did you just see that giant ray of light shooting up into the sky? They're called light pillars. And don't worry, they're not a magic trick. Just a bunch of ice crystals playing tricks on us. You see, when it's cold outside, these ice crystals floating near the ground reflect light from unshielded lights and create these columns of light that look like they're coming from outer space. 
But really, it's just a bunch of little crystals showing off their reflective skills. And if you think those natural light pillars are cool, wait till you see the artificial ones. They can be even taller because the light from streetlights is not the same. Ice crystals can reflect the light even if they're a little tilted. Just imagine, all that light is coming from streetlights just a few feet away. So next time you see a light pillar, don't run for cover, just enjoy the show. If you come across these quirky, bubble-like shapes in the sky, consider yourself lucky. These little gems are called mammatus clouds, and they're not your everyday run-of-the-mill clouds. Most clouds are formed when air rises, making them look like big cotton balls. But mammatus clouds are formed when air sinks, making them look like they're upside down. The air above and below such clouds creates a little turbulence, and before you know it, cloud particles form perfectly round orbs. Just don't stand there gawking at them for too long. They often signal that a thunderstorm is on its way. What do we have here? It looks like the sun is wearing a colorful party hat made of rainbows on top of the Ohr Mountains in Germany. This phenomenon is called a sun halo, by the way. These snow-covered trees look like they're joining in on the fun too. It's all thanks to those ice crystals in high clouds. They love to bend and reflect light, making it look like the sun is having a halo lava lamp dance party. And yes, it might mean that bad weather is just around the corner, but don't let it spoil your fun. You can still hang around and take some great pictures. Ah, a purple sunset. You must have seen one of those at least once in your life. Normally, it's nothing ominous and has to do with the way light travels. The light that the sun produces is white. When it goes through a prism, you see light waves of different colors, from red and orange to blue, green, and indigo. Light normally travels in a straight line if there's no obstacle in its way. The shorter light waves, including blues and purples, are scattered easier when they meet with those obstacles, like molecules and aerosols in the atmosphere. Because the sun is low on the horizon at sunset and sunrise, its light has to pass through more molecules that scatter the violet and blue light. The colors that your eyes pick up, then, are yellow, orange, and red. But with the right conditions, you can see the gorgeous purple sky. Sometimes purple sky appears for much scarier reasons. It can be caused by hurricanes, wildfires, or dust storms. The concentration of vapor in the air increases, and the light scatters more than usual. Dust, a setting sun, and low cloud cover all contribute to this natural show, too. The sky turns orange and red at dusk if there's still enough light. Then it gives off pink hues, which mix up with a dark blue sky above. Now, do you remember what happens when you mix pink and blue? You get the color purple. Not every hurricane makes the sky turn purple, and trying to predict if it's going to happen is like trying to forecast a rainbow. Still, people reported several major hurricanes made the skies turn purple. Now, green skies might look just as spectacular as purple ones, but they actually also scream danger. They're usually there to tell you a thunderstorm, hailstorm, or a tornado is somewhere nearby. The unique color is a result of yellow sun rays getting mixed with the blue light coming from storm clouds. So you're enjoying a nice day by the ocean with a fresh breeze in your hair, when suddenly you notice the water starts retreating from the beach at a huge speed. This is a sign for you to start running as fast and far away from the beach as you can. This most likely means that a tsunami is on the way. A quick reaction maximizes your chances of survival. Now, if you notice the sea level is rising, but it doesn't seem too extreme, it could be another sign of an approaching tsunami. It happens in 40% of cases, and the incoming water is the first tsunami wave. The next one, way larger and more dangerous, usually follows in about 10 minutes. Another thing about tsunamis is that they like to arrive with some loud sounds. People describe them as thunder, the sound of a locomotive, a helicopter, or just a loud boom. Do you see a channel of choppy water on the beach? It's in your best interest to stay away from the water. There might be a rip current under the surface that can be extremely dangerous. Sometimes waves hit the shore in a weird way, which forms these rip currents. You might see a strange break in the waves, 
or an area with a different color than the rest of the water. Random bits of seaweed going in all directions is another rip current warning sign. If you happen to find yourself caught in a rip current, try to stay afloat but don't try to go against the current. You'll only waste precious energy. Scream for help and try to float your way along the beach. Once you break out of the current, swim diagonally to the shore. The next time you spot conically shaped clouds in the sky, remember it's a good time to start looking for some shelter. If it just stays like that, a severe storm is on the way. But if a cloud of that shape starts spinning around, it means it's about to transform into a tornado. If you have bees nearby, they can save you from big trouble one day. These hard-working little guys get more active than usual when they feel like a storm is on the way. They speed up to collect more nectar before it hits them, and once they're done with it, they'll always come back to the hive 10 to 15 minutes before heavy rain, even when there are no obvious signs of it coming. Their secret is super-sensitive hairs on the back that can pick up electrostatic buildups from storm clouds. For centuries, people have noticed that animals act weirdly a couple of days before big seismic events. Dogs can't stop barking, cows halt their milk, and toads, rats, and snakes leave their homes. It looks like animals can feel smaller initial shock waves that humans don't even notice. Scientists have tried to find some legit explanation for it and run endless tests and experiments. But so far, they're still on their way to explaining this mystery. Can you smell ozone in the air? When a thunderstorm is on the way, it's the most distinct and pungent smell you can pick up. An electrical charge of lightning sets it free from higher altitudes. The other, more pleasant smell of rain is petrichor. Rainwater wakes up molecules on plants, trees, concrete, and asphalt. Their aroma spreads all over the place. You can even feel that smell in your own mouth. All those positive ions in the air that a lightning bolt sets free gets mixed with ozone and your saliva, and that's how you get that bitter metallic taste. When lightning is about to strike, you might hear bizarre crackling, buzzing, or vibrating sounds coming from metal objects nearby. Your palms may begin to sweat, and then you can feel your hair stand on end. That's a clear call for action, and that action is to run for your life. Positive charges are going through your body, trying to reach toward the negatively charged part of the storm. Trust me, you don't want these charges to meet. If you see no shelter that you can reach fast, try to make yourself smaller than the objects around you. Drop down your umbrella and stay away from wire fences, metal pipes, rails, and other metallic objects. And don't lie flat on the ground, it's likely wet, which means it's a great conductor of electricity. If you suddenly notice crevices in the asphalt next to your house, it could be a sinkhole warning sign. Inspect your house on the inside. Does that door begin to jam? Or maybe there's a gap where the walls meet the ceiling. Uneven kitchen cabinets and drawers, slanted floors, stairs that begin to slope, water leaking after every rain, and displaced moldings are all signs that a sinkhole is about to open. To find out if it's definitely a sinkhole and how dangerous it is, you gotta consult with an engineering company. If you find a sinkhole that's already there, you gotta stay away from the sinkhole area. Fence or rope it off to make it less dangerous for others. You'll need professional help to fix it. Some volcanoes scream when they're about to erupt. Small earthquakes, which often happen before, produce a hum. It's mostly non-audible to human ears, but sometimes it reaches a frequency that lets you hear it as a strange rumbling or hissing sound coming from the ground. This noise is known as a harmonic tremor. With some volcanoes, it's the sound of magma bubbles vibrating when they're going through crevices in the crust of the Earth. But it's not always like this. If scientists manage to understand what exactly causes these volcanic streams, they could create a limited early warning system for volcanic eruptions. If you're out in the wild, pay attention to the water in creeks, streams, and rivers. If its level is quickly falling, even if it's raining, this might be a sign of a nearing landslide. And if you hear a faint rumbling noise or unusual sounds, like boulders knocking together, it could mean debris is on its way to you. It's a sign to head to safety immediately, like right now. 
On some nights, when the sky over a powerful thunderstorm is clear, you might see elves, gnomes, trolls, or blue jets. Blue jets sound kind of random here, right? But we're not actually talking about fairy tales. These are all just different types of lightning flashes that are mostly visible very high above raging thunderstorm clouds. Let's take red sprites. Those are flashes of light that appear above thunderstorms that come in clusters. They are rare because they're only caused by a specific type of lightning called positive cloud-to-ground strikes. So a positive charge is transferred from a thundercloud to the ground during a lightning strike. These types of lightning make up only 10% of all lightning strikes. For more than half a century, many believed these flashes were just urban legends. People did see them from time to time, but the flashes were so brief that even if you had been lucky enough to catch them, you wouldn't have had time to call someone to witness this phenomenon with you. Even when respectable scientists or pilots would talk about them, the scientific community would mostly ignore them. In 1989, something strange happened. The researchers from the University of Minnesota actually managed to catch sprites on film. And that's how it started. People across the world began sharing videos and photos of red sprites. Red sprites can start as 328-foot balls made of ionized air. These balls shoot down from heights of about 50 miles at 10% of the speed of light. And researchers have been studying not only the lightning that plunges down from ranging clouds, but these colorful flashes that go towards space too. So, electricity stretches up to the electrically charged ionosphere, but at the same time, it crushes down towards the ground. Red sprites come in different shapes, like these big, cool jellyfish sprites that sometimes have areas that measure up to 30 square miles. You may see carrot sprites or column sprites. They're similar, it's just that carrots also have long tendrils. The lower parts of tendrils are often blue, while the higher ones are red. On August 22, 2022, we were able to take some stunning photos of red right streaks in the sky above the Atacama Desert in Chile. They were surrounded by another bigger glow of greenish color. It's something we call air glow, and you can only see it this well when there's no light pollution. It's basically when we use too much artificial light, and among other things, it doesn't allow us to observe stars and other objects we might otherwise see in the sky. And this air glow happens because of atoms of nitrogen and oxygen in our atmosphere. Sunlight knocks away their electrons during daytime. Then, they slowly recombine with their electrons, which is a process that causes them to glow. How can you see a red sprite? First, you need to find a large thunderstorm. They're more common during summer and spring, for example, in June. Of course, sprites can appear at any time if there are powerful enough storms with lightning at ground level. The skies need to be clear and very dark, ideally without bright moonlight. And the storm should be around 100 to 200 miles away. That way, clouds won't block the sky and you'll have better visibility. In the perfect scenario, the storm will be moving along a distant horizon, so you'll be able to see everything above the cloud tops. You can track a storm with weather radar. Your eyes need some time to adapt to the darkness around you. Give them some time, about 20 to 30 minutes. Keep your eyes above the clouds and try not to look at the clouds directly. Ignore lightning flashes. A sprite will pop maybe once for every 200 lightning strikes. Don't expect to really capture it on camera, it's not easy. But the view itself will likely be worth the wait. This and similar flashy events are something we call TLEs, which stands for Transient Luminous Events. Blue jets are also worth mentioning. These are dim blue lights that stream up like a very fast puff of smoke above powerful hailstorms. They're also very rare, and in most cases, you'll only be able to see them from an airplane. And now we get to those fairy tale creatures. 
Elves, when we talk about lightning flashes, are brief disks of dim light you can see about 60 miles high in the atmosphere. It's just an abbreviation. Their full name is Emissions of Light and Very Low Frequency Perturbations Due to Electromagnetic Pulse Sources. Yeah, I suggest we stick to elves. Moving to trolls. Those are red spots that pop close to cloud tops after the flash of a very powerful red sprite. Gnomes are the smallest and fastest flashes. We're talking about tiny white spikes of light that flash from the top of a big anvil of thunderclouds. The anvil is that elongated cloud you see at the top of a raging storm. It spreads downwind together with upper level winds, and gnomes last for only a microsecond. And check this out. Ball lightning is in the shape of fiery orbs that can be as big as a golf ball or can grow up to a very large beach ball. They can be yellow, red, white, orange, green, or purple. And they can stay alive for a couple of seconds, even minutes sometimes. Over the centuries, many people have been talking about how they saw ball lightning, sometimes even floating into their homes. But such events are really unpredictable and happen very rarely. Scientists have managed to recreate ball lightning in the lab, or at least something very similar to it. They have realized that ball lightning probably shows up after a lightning bolt strikes the ground. Mineral grains in the soil then vaporize. Here's something spectacular, volcanic lightning. This one is born in the plumes of a wild volcanic eruption. Like the rest of thunderstorms, volcanic lightning forms when static electricity builds up in Earth's atmosphere. And then it gets released in the shape of a lightning bolt. Scientists don't understand the whole mechanism here, but they think it's related to charging. For example, ice charging is what causes thunderstorms to form. It plays a part in producing lightning during volcanic eruptions too. This happens when the air heated in an eruption rises into the sky and meets cold air. The water from the eruption turns into ice particles, and when these particles bump into each other, some electrons get knocked off. The ice particles that now have more positive charges move higher into the sky and gather together. Or it may be frictional charging, another thing that leads to volcanic lightning. The same as ice charging happens when tiny particles of ice collide. Here we have ash and pieces of rock colliding and creating charged ions. There's dark lightning too. Over 10 years ago, researchers discovered that thunderstorms could generate brief but very strong bursts of gamma rays, which is the form of light with the highest energy. They are so bright that they can blind sensors on satellites, even when they're hundreds of miles away. They can also create antimatter. Antimatter is a type of matter made of particles with opposite charges compared to the particles in normal matter. Imagine having two boxes full of blocks. Some blocks are red and some are blue. When these pairs touch each other, they disappear or annihilate and turn into energy. That's what happens when particles of matter and antimatter meet. And these flashes could be the result of dark lightning because it gives off light that's not really visible. Regular lightning involves slow electrons. In dark lightning, electrons are high energy. They crash into air molecules and, by doing that, produce gamma rays. Not a lot of people have heard of this mysterious body of water named after famous English explorer Sir Francis Drake. Even though Drake himself never sailed through these waters, one of his ships did pass near this location and discovered a connection between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. That's how the area got named the Drake Passage in 1578. Soon enough, the passage became known for some mysterious disappearances. It got the reputation of being the roughest and most unpredictable stretch of water in the world. It's now known for its strong winds and rough seas with waves that can reach up to 60 feet in height. The passage also has powerful currents with speeds never seen before. Does it sound like a good start to an adventure book? Sure, it doesn't make the place any less real. If you ever decide to travel between the southern tip of South America and the southern tip of the Antarctic Peninsula, 
you will come across the infamous Drake Passage. We call this place the Drake Passage today, but locals still believe it should be named after Spanish explorer Francisco de Oces. He was a Spanish navigator who, in 1525, led the first known European expedition to navigate the Drake Passage. The trip was part of an attempt of Spain to find a new route to the Spice Islands in the East Indies. Oses and his two ships, the San Lesmes and the Santiago, sailed through the Strait of Magellan and into the Drake Passage, where they encountered treacherous weather and rough seas. Despite the difficulties, they successfully navigated the passage and became the first Europeans known to have done so. However, the expedition failed to find a new trade route and the crew returned to Spain with no significant discoveries. Some years later in 1616, another ship captained by Dutch navigator Willem Schouten made one of the most successful voyages through the Drake Passage. Despite the difficulties of navigating the often turbulent seas, eventually, the Drake Passage became an important part of international trade routes in the 19th and early 20th centuries. But this dangerous area holds many secrets. The record of one of the most famous events that happened here takes us back to the year 1914. During that time, a British explorer named Shackleton wanted to travel to Antarctica with 27 men split between two ships. Those were named the Endurance and the Aurora. The explorers wanted to check out two routes that reached the continent. But in 1915, the Endurance got stuck in ice while crossing the Drake Passage and was slowly crushed. Shackleton and his crew had to leave the ship and could only gather some personal belongings. The Endurance eventually sank and the crew had to survive on ice for a while. The mission changed from exploring to surviving and only in 1916 all the men were rescued. The Aurora suffered a similar fate. It also got stuck in ice and three men were lost at sea before the rest of the crew was rescued in 1917. For many years, the ship Endurance was thought to have been lost forever. But in 2022, a group of specialists went on a trip to find it. They left from Cape Town, South Africa on February 5th. The leader of the group said it was most likely the most difficult shipwreck search in history. They used special equipment to find the ship under the water and then used a special underwater camera to take a closer look. The members of the team were sure they had found the Endurance because it was in a place where very few ships had ever been. Despite being 10,000 feet underwater, the Endurance didn't look so shabby. It was actually pretty well preserved for a ship that had been underwater for more than 100 years. The explorers were still even able to see the word Endurance written on it. But it's not just ships that have a hard time with the Drake Passage. A plane with 38 people on board seemed to have disappeared over the Drake Passage in 2019, according to the Chilean authorities. It's believed it hit the icy and rough waters of the passage. Rescuers used ships, planes, and satellites to search for the missing plane and its passengers in the area where it had last sent messages. But the harsh conditions of the Drake Passage made the search very difficult. The exact location where the accident had happened was eventually found, but there were no survivors. The Viking Polaris is another of those ships that got damaged in the passage even though it was designed for tough conditions. It was faster than most ships and more stable because of special equipment that kept it balanced. One night back in 2022, the waves were indeed big, but the ship seemed to be doing well in the rough weather. But then on its way back to port in Ushuaia, Argentina, a rogue wave suddenly hit the ship without warning. People on board felt like they had been hit by an iceberg. Rogue waves are much taller than other waves around them, and they're very unpredictable. Scientists still don't know exactly why they occur. When this rogue wave hit the Viking Polaris ship, it immediately broke windows on the second deck. Some people on board were hurt, but thankfully, most of them had been properly trained before boarding the ship and knew what they had to do in case of an emergency. The crew was also very good at helping the passengers. Most of them even claimed later that they would board the ship for the second time despite such an unexpected experience. The boat eventually made it to the port without suffering further damage. What makes this region so hard to cross though? For starters, the Drake Passage is a wide and deep area of water. It's about 500 miles wide and has a depth of 15,000 feet. 
even the most experienced sailors who cross the passage every year say it can be dangerous, unpredictable, and even scary at times. And that's even considering the modern technologies we have today. The area is a mix of warm and cold temperatures, which can result in ravishing storms. Strong winds from the west push the water from the Pacific Ocean into the passage, creating waves and swells that can reach up to 30 feet or more. If accidents happen here, things can get ugly faster than anywhere else. The Drake Passage is a part of the ocean where the water is very cold and has strong currents. The bottom of the ocean there is also not stable, making it harder to find things like a plane or a ship. These days, we have modern technology that helps us feel safe, even when we're passing through rough seas. However, if you are planning to travel by boat to Antarctica, make sure you're ready for the rough sea in the Drake Passage and for feeling a little uneasy. This can happen even to the most experienced of people when the waters are rough, but it's especially tough if it's your first time. Some people bring remedies to avoid feeling sick, like ginger gum or scented wristbands. Others find it helpful to look at the horizon. Test things out to see what works for you. Once you arrive at the Drake Passage, you'll be surprised to see that lots of different animals live there. You can see many types of dolphins, birds, whales, and penguins. The water in the Drake Passage is also good for small animals like plankton, krill, which bigger animals such as whales, penguins, and seals generally have on their daily menus. As you get closer to Antarctica, watch out for the South Shetland Islands. These might be the first pieces of land you'll see. They're also located in the Antarctic Peninsula and were first discovered in 1819 by British explorer William Smith. The South Shetland Islands are home to severe active volcanoes, including Deception Island and Mount Fenton. The islands are also where you can find a number of endemic species, including the South Shetland Islands Gen 2 penguin which is only found on this piece of land. Road trips are fun, but sometimes you find yourself stuck on the road for hours. There seems to be no reason. It's like a traffic jam coming out of nowhere to spoil your journey. Let's find out more about these mile-long car queues. You might ask, how bad could it be? The road will eventually be open. Some of the worst traffic jams might answer this question on my behalf. In American history, traffic jams can be traced back to the 60s. In 1969, the Music and Arts Festival was held in New York. Way more people commuted to the festival than the festival organizers had expected. In the end, cars got stuck for eight hours on the New York State Thruway. In 2005, around 2.5 million people needed to evacuate from Texas due to a natural phenomenon. Since everyone gets in their cars around the same time, they collectively create 100 mile long congestion on an interstate highway. It took nearly two days to open the road again. In the winter of 2011, a blizzard hit Chicago, Illinois. The snow caused multiple major accidents. People ended up spending more than 12 hours in their vehicles. Their cars were buried in the snow. It looked like a scene from a movie. Of course, traffic jams are not joy destroyers unique to the US. In 1980, hundreds of people in France created an almost 110 mile long jam. What happens if hundreds of people return from a ski holiday around the same time? A huge traffic jam that gets into the Guinness World Records forms. Drivers had to drive slowly because of bad weather conditions. After this stressful experience, they probably crawled for another vacation. Hmm. Maybe massage therapy to loosen their muscles? Another world record comes from Sao Paulo. Imagine being trapped in the car for 180 miles. This case belongs to 2009, but heavy traffic is a big problem for the city in general. Regardless of the day or time, the city always has congestion on some roads. Los Angeles shares the same destiny as Sao Paulo. The city isn't just famous for Hollywood and other gorgeous amenities. It's also a place where you can experience the world's longest rush hour. So much so that the average time a driver spends in traffic delays is around 100 hours per year. Blizzards, extreme fog, or accidents are solid reasons for traffic jams, but sometimes there's no obvious reason. First, traffic slows down, then it stops entirely. 
it can take hours or only minutes for the cars to move again. Suddenly, you're driving in an open lane like Lightning McQueen. Was there a road construction or, I don't know, tons of apples spilled on the road from a truck? There are multiple causes of traffic mm. jams. It starts with us humans. Apparently, the driver's reaction time affects the size and formation of traffic jams. If the driver fails to perceive and respond at the correct time, the traffic gets inconsistent. One driver's delayed reaction affects the others. This creates an accordion effect. Studies reveal that the human factor significantly affects congestion. Around 650,000 drivers are using their cell phones while driving. This is one of the reasons the perception and response time of drivers drops. Bad driving behavior can lead to phantom traffic jams. The roads are haunted by supernatural creatures. I'm kidding. I'll get to the phantom traffic jams later on. Even though we keep our eyes off the phone or ignore the thoughts in our heads, we cannot magically make every driver react at the same speed, for instance. For that, we can get help from technology. Self-driving cars can comply with slowdowns more accurately compared to us. In theory, these types of cars can be effective in solving this problem. Is it just humans that cause the traffic? No, sometimes computers make errors and traffic signs stop working. Other times, green lights don't hold on for enough time. You stop at the red lights, four cars in front of you make a turn, and boom, the light turns to red. Here comes a cue. There are engineering errors too. Some traffic areas are overdeveloped. There, the mass transit system is already overcrowded, but the road system is inadequate for the demand. More obvious reasons, such as poor weather conditions and accidents, also block the traffic. Some routes lack public transportation options, so people had to hop into the car to reach their destination. Oh, and you can add construction work, lane closure, or double parking blockage to the list. Now we can talk about phantom traffic jams. Imagine you're on an already busy road. One driver brakes harshly to avoid hitting the car in front of it. This driver didn't follow a simple rule, safe stopping distance. You should leave room in between the cars before and after you. If people see the traffic density ahead, they should take their foot off the speed pedal at the right time. That can prevent traffic jams from arising. If one person waits until the last second to brake, they slow everyone down. This chain reaction can also be formed by a bump in the road too. One car brakes and the one behind it brakes slightly more than it should have. What's more interesting is that even when cars get out of this traffic wave, the wave itself doesn't go away. It slowly drifts backwards against the direction of traffic. Japanese researchers experimented with this phenomenon. They put 22 drivers on a small circular road. Drivers went at the same speed and kept the same space between themselves. Anyway, even in this small and controlled circle, traffic waves formed. This experiment proved that individual drivers are an important factor in traffic blockage. Yet, behavioral change doesn't completely end phantom traffic jams. Studies show that even if all cars move following the exact same rules and not even one driver does anything wrong, these waves can still occur. But if there are enough cars on the highway, even if people use their best driving abilities, phantom traffic jams will form. Because we're humans and we can't eliminate the human error factor even if we wanted to. Is there a white light at the end of the road? Yes, there are some things engineers can do to make blockages go away. If the roads are straight and smooth, the risk of heavy traffic decreases. The drivers won't hit the brakes suddenly. Knowing this, engineers designed most highways as straight as possible. They also placed variable speed limits to cut down on these traffic jams. These types of speed limits are like chameleons. The maximum speed limit is displayed on electronic traffic signs and changes according to the weather and road conditions. Since the speed limit is flexible, the areas leading into a phantom traffic jam are also controlled. Drivers slow down gradually. People spend hours in traffic every day commuting to work. This is a waste of time, energy, and productivity. These jams surely cost time, but they're also expensive. Experts say that it costs the US economy around $179 billion each year. If you're one of those people, 
Here are must-have things in your car in case you get caught up in one. The most prominent personality of a traffic jam is you'll rarely know when it can happen. A first aid kit is a must for this occasion. The same thing applies to medicines. Snacks, yeah, you don't want to be starving in the middle of a highway. A chocolate bar can easily cheer you up in a traffic jam. You can add hand sanitizer and wet wipes to the list. A phone charger is also vital. It's important for communication, but also, you know, scrolling through Instagram or watching funny cat videos to boost your mood. Cushions, pillows, and blankets. You can take turns and nap for a while. Do you have a traffic jam memory that you want to erase from your brain forever? If so, tell us about it. Whale watching is a popular bucket list item, but getting too close to these gorgeous sea creatures isn't the best idea, especially if you don't want to kick the bucket too early. Whales are generally curious and friendly giants, but they can be unpredictable when you cross their personal borders. First of all, they are huge, and one wrong move on their side could flip over your boat or seriously hurt you. Second, they are wild animals, and like any other wild animals, they can carry certain infections they could transfer to you if you get into direct contact. Plus, they have strong parental instincts, so if you approach their young by accident, they might think you want to take them away and will act accordingly. It is only safe to observe whales from the sea when you're accompanied by an experienced expert, both for your own good and for the good of the whale. Now, sometimes whales and dolphins strand themselves on the shore, for reasons scientists still can't explain. Quite recently, over 200 whales have been found on a remote beach in Tasmania, Australia. A rescue team rushed to the location to save the whales, half of which were still alive. The rescue operation was really complex due to the remote location. The locals were trying to help the whales, covering them with blankets and pouring buckets of water on them to keep them alive. This mutual effort of regular people and professional rescuers helped save around 100 whales. As to why this happened, one theory says the stranded whales might have had a leader who had some problems with orientation and took the whole pod to the wrong place. The Australian box jellyfish looks just like any other jellyfish you've probably met in the sea. But don't let these creatures deceive you. They're considered the most venomous marine animals. Box jellyfish got its name because it does look a lot like a box, unlike other kinds of jellyfish that float with the current rather than swim. This creature can reach a decent speed and choose its own direction. And here comes the scariest part. It has tentacles covered with tiny darts loaded with poison. Mm. People and animals that get unlucky enough to have a rendezvous with those tentacles face some pretty scary and sometimes even fatal consequences in just a matter of minutes. Before you decide to cancel your vacation by the ocean, you should know that only a few out of the 50 species of box jellyfish have venom that is lethal to humans. Ooh. There are some not-so-dangerous species living in warm coastal waters worldwide, and the lethal ones reside in the Indo-Pacific region and northern Australia. Good day, mate! Hmm? A blue-ringed octopus likes to pretend its only outstanding feature is the psychedelic color, but it can quickly and easily take away your life. This cute-looking sea monster likes to spend its time in the soft, sandy bottom or shallow tide pools and coral reefs. It normally hides in underwater crevices among shells or debris. If you somehow manage to find and disturb it there, the octopus will show you its signature blue rings as a warning signal. And if you don't get the hint, it will introduce you to its other signature feature, a venom a thousand times more powerful than cyanide. One octopus has enough of it to do away with 26 people within minutes. This venom is more toxic than that of land mammals. The octopus normally uses it to hunt crabs, shrimp, and small fish by pecking them with its beak and paralyzing them. The same can happen to a human victim. You'll unlikely even feel the bite until it's too late. The good news is that there have been no known cases of such incidents since the 1960s. If you don't disturb the blue ring octopus, it will never attack you first. If you enjoy picking shells on the beach, Make sure the ones you collect don't belong to a cone snail. 
It's nothing like its relatives living on land and eating fresh leaves and bark. There are over 500 species of this venomous sea creature, and a few that can really hurt you. These little snails are extremely vicious, just like Jimmy from third grade. They inject their venom through a harpoon-like tooth. The consequences of this injection can be quite terrible for you. Now, are you afraid of snakes? Well, I have some bad news for you. You can't escape them even in the water. Certain kinds of these creatures have adapted to live both on land and in the sea, especially in the warm waters of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. All the species we know so far are venomous, and sometimes an encounter with them can be super dangerous. The good news is that they only bite if you disturb them. So the safest way to go is in the opposite direction of these slithery sea creatures. Not only venomous sea creatures present a danger to you while you're in the water. Strong earthquakes sometimes cause the formation of massive ocean waves. If they head ashore, they hardly leave anything intact in their way. You know this dangerous sea phenomenon as a tsunami. There is also another type of this natural disaster called a meteor tsunami. They're caused by rapid storm systems and pressure changes above the open water. A powerful storm can generate a whole wall of water. Sometimes, this wall grows several feet high while it moves through a shallow continental shelf, inlets, or bays. If it gets strong enough, it can damage houses close to the water. It's really tricky to forecast or detect a meteor tsunami, because it's nearly impossible to tell from a seismic one. It happens much more often than regular tsunamis, especially in the Great Lakes area. Now, the ocean can be dangerous to you, even if you're staying in what seems like safety on the shore. One such unpleasant surprise could be a sneaker wave moving your way. As you can guess from its name, waves like this sneak out on unsuspecting beachgoers. They look average, but turn out to be way bigger and more dangerous than you could imagine. Sneaker waves always appear without warning after smaller waves carry huge amounts of water, sand, and gravel. They're so powerful, they can carry swimmers further away into the ocean. They can swipe you off your feet and into the water when you're casually strolling on a jetty or the beach or on an outcropping nearby. Oregon State University researchers found that sneaker waves form in offshore storms that carry wind energy to the ocean surface. With all that energy, several waves unite and overlap into one beast that stands higher and goes further ashore than a regular wave. Another thing that makes them more dangerous is that they're hard to predict. The logic of regular wave formation doesn't work with them. Square waves looking like a giant chessboard over the ocean are the reason many people visit the Isle of Ré off the western coast of France. If you visit it, you'll notice plenty of signs warning you to stay away from the water once you notice the unusual pattern. The safest way to observe it is from high up places like nearby lighthouses. If you decide to stay in the water, the strong currents coming from two directions can literally sweep you off your feet. Generally, waves can travel many miles over the surface of the water, depending on local winds and weather. And even on days when the weather seems somewhat calm, storms located elsewhere can send in crashing waves that affect the surrounding calm waters. When waves travel onto the shores of distant lands, they're called swells. This is different from a wave that occurs from the local wind. When two different swells coming from opposite directions meet, it's known as a cross sea. This is what generates these square waves that you see near the Isle of Rhe. The cross sea phenomenon can appear in different locations around the world. The Isle of Rhe is one of them, thanks to specific wind and weather patterns that create the perfect storm which makes this cross sea so beautiful and well recognizable. Well, wasn't that swell? Uh, swell? Eh, never mind. We've been dreaming about life on Mars for a long time. Not only about growing potatoes there in the future, but also about all the potatoes that could have been there in the past. Has there ever been life on Mars? Recently, scientists have found something that could be evidence of that. Let's find out what happened. Mars is the fourth planet from the Sun. A human hasn't set foot on Mars yet, but robots have set their wheels. The first spacecraft that visited the red planet were NASA Viking landers. 
They flew there back in 1976 and sent us a lot of interesting data. Back then, we didn't know anything about Mars. To us, it looked like a cold, lifeless desert. But since we're so similar, scientists began to wonder, has it always been like this? Or is it possible that once Mars used to be thriving and full of life? And in 2022, NASA's Mars rover Perseverance found something that could shed a light on this mystery. But first of all, what is Perseverance? Scientists have suggested that if there was life on Mars once, it's unlikely that it could simply disappear without a trace. It must have left some traces, perhaps underground, where they would be protected from radioactive solar tantrums and other nastiness. So we need to check the rocks. It's important to note that we aren't looking for life on Mars right now. There most likely isn't any. Instead, we want to look into the distant past of our twin planet. We're talking billions of years ago, when Mars could have been warm, green, and far from lifeless. In other words, we have to find dead microbes and various chemical compounds similar to ones on the Earth. This is the mission of our main character, Perseverance. It arrived on Mars in February of 2021. The spacecraft landed on the bottom of the 30-mile-wide Jezero crater, and after landing, it scooted over to the west to the place that prompted scientists to choose Jezero for research. This place is a dried-up river delta, and this former river is already more than 3.5 billion years old. The Jezero crater itself was once a large lake. Yup, apparently there was life on Mars, and scientists have suggested that these places would be perfect as bodyguards of microbes. That's exactly what bacteria do on Earth. They hide being still in the depths of lakes and ponds, so we could probably find traces there. The researchers believe that this particular lake has the highest scientific value in the entire mission. The highest chance to find rocks on which such bacteria could survive is here in Jezero. So Perseverance went to the delta. The row wasn't easy, though. The rover missed a little and landed further than planned. As one famous movie said, this little maneuver is going to cost us 51 years. Fortunately, Perseverance took only one year, and on the way, it was able to explore Jezero a little. The rover uses a complex built-in tool to explore the world. The tool is called Scanning Habitable Environments with Raman and Luminescence for Organics and Chemicals, or just Sherlock. Boy, NASA sure loves its acronyms. As the device approached the Delta, the signal of organic molecules became stronger. Soon, these signals were everywhere, and besides, they were the brightest that the scientists have ever seen. What does it mean? Elementary, my dear Watson. You know, Sherlock. It's time to dig. Since July 2021, Perseverance has drilled and collected four thin cores of sedimentary rock. The total number of collected rocks at the moment is 12. This is the first time in history that we're collecting something like this on another planet. These four cores were found on two rocks called Skinner Ridge and Wildcat Ridge. The first pair of cores, the ones from the Skinner Ridge, don't seem very interesting at first glance. They're quite close to what we can find in many places on Earth. However, if we look at them closer, we'll see that they're dotted with round grains of some dark material. These dark grains could have once been deposited on them by an ancient river, the same one that flowed into Jezero. It's possible that the river brought them from places hundreds of miles away from Jezero. And that's pretty cool. If we study these cores, we'll be able to learn even more about the far corners of Mars. Well, there are no corners on it, but you get the idea. Then, in April 2022, Perseverance did arrive at the Delta. And then scientists finally found what they were looking for. The discovery, to put it mildly, excited them. They found two more cores, which held organic substances. This pair was taken from the Wildcat Ridge. It's found very close to the Skinner Ridge, but the two rocks are quite different from each other. These samples are lighter in color and more uniform. Most likely, they're mudstone, an unusual rock similar to clay, but harder and unable to absorb water. They're also finer grain than the cores of the Skinner Ridge. Why does it matter? Because the finer the grains in the stone, 
the more likely it is that there may be some traces of a past life in it. On Earth, fine-grained stones most often lie on the bottoms of ponds and in similar places. There, they can preserve the remains of dead organisms and similar stuff for years. And this is exactly what we found on them. Additionally, according to scientists, there was more organic matter in these two cores than in any other place studied by Perseverance so far. It probably accumulated there while the lake was gradually evaporating billions of years ago. So, there really was life on Mars? Well, let's slow down a little. Organic substances are molecules holding carbon. And yes, on Earth, they're most often associated with life, but not always. Sometimes they can form as a result of other things. Therefore, we cannot say for sure whether there was life on Mars. We don't know if these molecules really remain from some Martian microbes, or if they're the result of some other things. But the discovery is still very significant. We have to literally keep digging this way. To learn more about this organic matter, scientists need to collect a couple more samples of fine-grained rock. It would also be great to study the material lying around these former reservoirs. Perseverance has already moved to another area, to a place with a beautiful name, Enchanted Lake. Now it needs to look for similar things there. It will also continue to study Lake Jezero. Eventually, Perseverance will climb to the top of the delta and then continue exploring ancient sites outside the crater. Sometime before the end of 2022, Perseverance will probably have six or more samples of the Martian cores. Unfortunately, its tools, though complex, are quite limited. This data alone won't be enough for us to get a complete picture. Therefore, NASA plans to send other spacecraft to Jezero in the coming years. Together with the European Space Agency, they're working on the next robotic mission, known as the Mars Sample Return. The name speaks for itself. These devices will arrive and take away all the test tubes from the old Prospector Perseverance. After that, these samples will be delivered to Earth, though not by Amazon Prime, and then scientists will be able to analyze them in advanced laboratories. However, all this will take a really long time. The launch of this mission is scheduled for 2027-2028, and the spacecrafts won't be able to return until 2033. But if everything goes well, it will be the first samples in history delivered to Earth from Mars. In other words, there's still enough space for research, literally. And yes, we don't yet know the true meaning of these finds. But that's why the entire mission was created, right? And who knows? Maybe in a few years we'll finally find out the truth about what happened on Mars billions of years ago. Ooh, check out the Martian! Made you look! To look. Imagine you're on a vacation and your hotel reservation gets cancelled. Bummer! You'll have to find another place to stay, right? Yeah. You start Googling for accommodations when you stumble upon this ad. It mentions a hotel that seemingly has an infinite number of rooms. They'll surely have a room available for you, right? Oh, yeah. You arrive at the hotel and you're greeted at the check-in desk by the hotel manager. This receptionist in particular sure does look special. You'll soon find out why. He starts by saying all his rooms are booked. The infinite number of rooms are all filled by an infinite number of guests. But wait, the manager might have a solution to still check you in. Told you he was special. Oh. He begins to explain that all the rooms in the hotel are numbered, starting from room number one. It goes on to room number two, then three, moving forward infinitely. At this hotel, there is only one person allowed per room. So if there is one person in each one of the rooms, how will he make space for you? Simple. He asks each one of the guests to move down a room. This way, the person staying in room number one moves over to room number two that person in room number three, and so on. Once every one of those infinite numbers of guests moves down a room, the first one becomes available for you to stay. Ooh, yeah. While you're waiting at the reception, a bus shows up, wanting to check in too. 100 guests are waiting inside the bus. The receptionist applies the same strategy. He moves everyone down 100 rooms until the first 100 rooms become empty and ready to receive guests. 
word rapidly spreads around that there's a hotel that can fit a lot of guests. Obviously, more buses like this one start to arrive. And they're not just a lot of buses. An infinite number of buses with an infinite number of passengers get lined up at the hotel entrance. Our receptionist is clever yet again. He opens his infinite agenda with an infinite number of pages and starts preparing a table. This one too has an infinite number of columns and rows. In this table, there's a row for each bus, with the row at the top for all the people that are already in the hotel. He uses the columns to show the position each person occupies. He's got room number one, room number two, and so on. He moves on to fill the table with bus one, seat one, then bus one, seat two. His goal is to make sure each person gets their unique code. This code is made out of a combination of the vehicle and the seat number. He then proceeds to show everyone how he'll assign the rooms. Starting with the top left corner of his table, he draws a line that zigzags back and forth across the table, going over each person exactly once. If he could pull at that line from each end, he'd transform an infinite by infinite table into one single row. Once the order from that line is defined, he assigns each room number to its designated visitor. Everyone fits once again. Just as our brilliant receptionist is about to take a break, a big bus appears at the hotel entrance. Not a regular vehicle, but a party bus. It has no seats. But as you can already imagine by now, this one has an infinite number of passengers too. As they step down from the bus, you listen to their names. They sure are weird. Soon enough, one of the new party visitors starts to explain why they call each other the way they do. Since there's an infinite number of them in the bus, they've all decided to use unique identifiers, only using the letters X and Z. To keep with the theme, these names are also infinitely long. One person might be named XXXXXXXXXX, with letters going on indefinitely, while another may be named XZ, 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 XZ again, with its name going on forever. After thinking about it for a bit, you figure out that there's a person for each possible infinite sequence of these two letters. But just as the people from the party bus start entering the hotel, the receptionist says that he's not able to fit all of them into the hotel. It might be a bit complicated to explain this time, he says, but let me try. He starts by opening up his infinite agenda once again. He then proceeds to assign rooms to the people on the bus. Let's say room number one is for the person named XXXXXXXXXX. Well, room number two is for the person named XZ, 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 XZ. To finish up, he'd technically have to keep going, allocating a different string of X's and Z's to each of his infinite number of rooms. Here's where it gets tricky, he says, because even if we complete this infinite list of names, I can still name a person who won't be assigned a room. All you have to do is to figure out who that person is, is to take the first letter of their name and switch it. So X becomes Z. Then you take the second letter of the second name and switch it from Z to an X. If you keep doing that, the name you write down is surely not going to appear on the list. You might have stumbled upon a hotel with an infinite number of rooms, but that's not to say it can fit literally everyone because those rooms are infinite, but they are countably infinite. Even if it would take forever, you could technically count all the rooms in the hotel. The reason why you can't squeeze all the people from the party bus is that those people are uncountably infinite. There's no systematic way to identify them. When you look at it this way, it does make you think, are some infinities bigger than others? This theory is called David Hilbert's Infinite Grand Hotel, and it's not the only one of its kind. The friendship theory is a funny one too. It means that most people have fewer friends than their friends have. Hello. So if you have three friends, chances are that your friends have more than three friends each. It's like a puzzle. It's hard to figure out why this happens, but it's true. It was first noticed back in 1991 by a sociologist named Scott Feld. He made this unusual discovery when looking at existing social networks. 
he calculated the average number of friends that a person has and then compared this number to the average number of friends those respective friends had too. The interesting part happened when he noticed the second number is always bigger. Problem is, there's no logical explanation for this phenomenon. Why is this important, you might ask? Because it affects the way we perceive ourselves in relation to others. Most of us look at our friends as being happier, richer, and more popular than they are. But it's important to remember that almost everyone is in the same situation. Then, there are Zeno's theories, which are puzzles about motion. They ask questions like, if you have to take half of the steps to get somewhere, and then half of those steps, and then half of those steps, will you ever get there? The answer is yes. Even though it might seem like you'll never get to the end, if you keep taking half of the steps, you will eventually get there. It may seem weird, but all these theories are in fact paradoxes. In math, there are mathematical conclusions so absurd that it's difficult to understand even though every step you took before reaching that said conclusion is correct. In most scenarios, the paradox is the contradiction of the statements themselves. In David Hilbert's Infinite Grand Hotel, for example, these statements are that the hotel can be fully booked and have rooms available at the same time. Hey, want to hear something shocking? In an ordinary house outlet that we use to charge the phone, the voltage is 110 volts. A high-voltage power line that provides electricity to dozens of buildings has a voltage of 100,000 volts. The energy of one lightning strike is more than 10 million volts. Woo! And the temperature of lightning is almost twice the temperature on the sun's surface. And this incredible charge is flying at a speed of just two and a half times slower than the speed of light. Now imagine what happens to a person when lightning strikes them. Well, let me tell you. The discharge passes through the body in one hundredth of a second. Lightning can stop our hearts and disrupt the work of our entire nervous system. You may not even realize what has happened at first. Perhaps you will lose consciousness and your body will be in a state of shock. Every day, there are several million lightning strikes in the world. Fortunately, you have little chance of getting hit by one. The odds that lightning will strike you is about 15,300 to 1. About 20,000 people are struck by lightning every year. The chances that lightning will strike you twice are even smaller. And what are the odds that you'll be struck by lightning seven times throughout your life? It seems impossible, but one person experienced it for himself. His name was Roy Sullivan. He was born in 1912 in Greene County, Virginia, in a big family with seven children. Roy was an ordinary guy and was no different from his brothers and sisters. But, for some reason, the natural element chose him. In 1936, he began working as a ranger at Shenandoah National Park. There, lightning struck him seven times over 35 years. So, the first accident happened in April 1942. On that day, a strong thunderstorm began. Roy took refuge in a new fire tower where builders hadn't installed a lightning rod. Lightning struck the building several times. A massive fire started inside and Roy ran out. As soon as he was a few feet away from the shelter, lightning hit his toe and burned a hole in his shoe. The next time occurred 27 years later, in July 1969. Roy was working in the National Park. He was driving a truck through hilly terrain when a storm started. Lightning struck him through the open car window. The charge burned his eyebrows and eyelashes and slightly touched his hair. Roy lost consciousness and the car continued to move. It stopped at the very edge of a cliff. Fifteen minutes later, Roy came to his senses. A year later, in July 1970, the third time occurred. The weather was fine, but in a matter of minutes, Clouds became thicker and a thunderstorm began. Lightning struck a transformer near Roy. The man ran away as fast as possible, but nature got him again. Lightning hit his shoulder. Two years later, in 1972, lightning struck Roy for the fourth time while he was working at the National Park Station. The charge set his hair on fire. 
and the man ran to the bathroom and used a wet towel to put out the flames on his burning head. From that moment, Roy began to suspect that some invisible evil force had been pursuing him. He started to carry a bottle of water with him to put out the fire in case of another hit. The fifth strike happened in the National Park again. It occurred in 1973. Roy tripped over a rock and fell. At that moment, he noticed thunderclouds in the sky. Frightened, he ran to his truck, got inside, and stepped on the gas. Roy drove as far from that spot as possible. Then he stopped and got out of the car to see where the storm was. And at that moment, lightning struck again. It went through his left arm and left leg and set his shoe on fire. Roy quickly climbed back into the truck and extinguished the fire using his water bottle. In 1976, the sixth case occurred. Roy was walking along a trail in the park, just one mile away from the place where lightning struck him the last time. And then storm clouds appeared again. Lightning flashed and stung Roy in the palm. After the sixth strike, he began to suspect something was wrong with the park. After 40 years of working, Roy finally decided to quit. Finally. He hoped the lightning would stop chasing him. But he was wrong. By that time, the man had already become a celebrity. But such fame didn't let him enjoy life. People were afraid to be near him because they believed the lightning could hit them at any moment. Journalists gave Roy Sullivan the nicknames Spark Ranger and Human Lightning Conductor. Of course, the man disliked all of this and felt very lonely. But besides this problem, he also suffered from constant fears and the feeling of persecution. All the time, he was waiting for the lightning to strike again at any moment. Fortunately, he was married. His wife supported him and helped him in everything. After quitting his job, Roy decided to move with his wife to the small town of Dooms, Virginia. Wow, Dooms. Talk about foreshadowing. It was only a year without accidents. Then, on June 25, 1977, lightning struck Roy again. He went fishing at the local pond early in the morning. The catch was good, but the sky was overcast. Roy immediately felt there would be a strike. There was a smell of sulfur in the air, and the hairs on his arms stood on end. His whole body tensed. Lightning struck Roy in the head, passing through his chest and stomach. The man ran to his car to take cover. At that moment, a hungry bear came out of the forest. He approached Roy's bucket of fish to pick up all the trout the man had caught. Roy ran out of the vehicle with his hair on his head smoldering to chase the animal away. After the seventh lightning strike, he lost hearing in his left ear and realized he couldn't hide from the lightning anywhere. His wife was afraid to be with him outside during a thunderstorm. One day, she was hanging laundry in the backyard. Roy came out of the house to help her. A few minutes later, lightning struck his wife. Fortunately, she wasn't badly injured. After that, besides fear and social loneliness, he felt guilt. Of course, many doctors and scientists tried to help Roy. But no one managed to find the reason for this strange phenomenon. According to science, each time it was just a coincidence. Mathematics and physics were powerless here. With such answers from scientists, Roy believed that invisible forces were pursuing him or that fate was punishing him for something. Perhaps the answer lies in the man's past. The National Park Service and doctors documented all seven times when he was struck by lightning. But there was another eighth time, which couldn't be confirmed. According to Roy, lightning struck him in his youth when he was helping his father mow wheat. The discharge hit the scythe blade. No one but the boy saw it. Perhaps at that moment, the lightning changed something in his body and made him more attractive for the next hits. Lightning always chooses the path of least resistance. And this is how lightning occurs. Rain, ice, and snow particles collide with one another inside a storm. This process increases the imbalance between clouds and the ground, negatively charging the lower layers of clouds. Things down there, like trees and the Earth, get positively charged and create another imbalance. 
Nature tries to remedy this imbalance between the two opposite charges by passing an electric current through them. Perhaps nature felt some charge imbalance in Roy's body and tried to remedy it. But why did he get struck at an interval of 1 to 2 years? Besides, more than 20 years passed between the first and second hit. Scientists still can't explain what happened to him. Maybe Roy was just an attractive guy. As you can probably predict, Roy Sullivan was listed in the Guinness Book of Records as the person struck by lightning most often in the world. There's a heavy snowstorm. The cold penetrates his bones. His legs are almost knee-deep in snow. Experienced hunter Joe LaBelle makes his way through the forest, covering his face from the headwind. Any other person would have already fallen and screamed in despair, but not Joe LaBelle. He can survive in any circumstances and always knows what to do. Right now, he's heading to one of the villages in the far north of Canada. This small settlement is located on Lake Anjakuni. The inhabitants of this village are Inuit, indigenous people of North America. Joe hasn't eaten or drunk for a long time. He needs a good sleep and a hot meal, which he hopes to get from the hospitable Inuits. Through trees and a white haze, he notices the silhouettes of tents. Smoke is coming from some houses. Joe will probably get there in time for lunch. He reaches the village, and at this moment, the wind calms down. The blizzard has ended. The hunter speeds up and goes toward the village, located along the frozen lake. It's strange, but there are no locals anywhere. Probably everyone is just sitting in their houses, waiting out the blizzard. Hello, Joe says loudly, but gets no response. Oh, great, smoke is coming out of this tent. Joe knocks on the wall, but no one opens it. He knocks a few more times and goes inside. The little tent is empty. All things are in their places. There's a piece of cloth with needles and thread on the table. Firewood is smoldering in the fireplace. It seems that people have just left this place. Joe goes into the next tent and sees the same picture. All things are in their places, but there are no people. Joe walks past the tents and sees a pit where a bonfire once burned. There's a rope above it with the meat that the Inuit were cooking hanging on it. For some reason, they didn't eat it. Lake Anjakuni is part of a chain of waterways. Here, the Inuits fished and traded various goods. Usually, there are many people here, but now something has forced them to leave their homes. Why did they leave their things behind? And where did they go? There are no tracks around the village. All the sleds are in place. The Inuits have even left their dogs here. And dogs help them to hunt and ride sleighs. No one will leave warm clothes and dogs here when moving away, especially in severe weather. Joe LaBelle knows all this, so he concludes that something terrible has happened here. His body is shaking, not from the cold, but from fear. After going around the entire settlement, he finds not a single soul. Terrified, he leaves the village, heads for the nearest telegraph pole, and sends a message to the police. After a while, more and more people arrive. The police are trying to find traces of missing people and figure out what has happened. But there's nothing. Near the village, they find an empty grave. During the ceremony, the Inuits placed stones around the burial site. The rocks around the open pit lie untouched, which means it wasn't an animal that dug it up. But who or what needed it? About 30 people lived in the village, and they're all gone. Local residents from neighboring villages can't help, since they have no idea what has happened. The only thing that the police have noticed is unusual blue lights. In this area, the northern lights are a common phenomenon. People living here regularly see a glow in the starry sky. But the police have seen something else, pulsing blue lights. Also, other hunters have witnessed something similar. They say that some strange things were flying in the sky. This all happened in 1930. 
It's been almost 90 years since the disappearance of the village, and people have created a bunch of theories. The most popular of them is an attack of an extraterrestrial civilization. According to this theory, the blue lights in the sky that the locals and the police saw were spaceships. Some believe that one ominous night, these ships flew to the settlement and took away all the people. In addition to these sci-fi versions, there were also more realistic ones. Internet users have found out that Joe LaBelle didn't have a hunting license. Maybe he wasn't a professional and made it all up. But at that time, many hunters didn't have a license, so Joe's words may be true. But if we try to find out where all this information came from, we'll see that the primary sources were books and some newspaper articles from the 30s. But none of them can confirm that the mysterious story of Lake Anjakuni is true. Perhaps this entire story was made up. Now let's leave the snows of Canada and head for the hot plains of India. In this big country, there's one sinister village where people also disappeared without a trace. This happened in the first half of the 19th century. Still, locals avoid this place even now because they believe that invisible evil forces live there. Let's check and find out what happened to the village of Kuldara. It's located in the district of Rajasthan. To get there, you can use a taxi to get to the nearest village or city. The village is located far from other settlements. It looks deserted. There are only ruins. It looks like archaeologists have recently dug this place out of the ground and left it here. But this is not an ancient city. The village was abandoned more than 200 years ago. But up to that point, this place had been thriving. Kuldara was a large village. Local people were mostly farmers. They sold their agricultural products. And then, one night, everything changed. People abandoned their homes and stuff and ran away from there. No one knows why they did it, and no one knows where they went. Nobody has ever seen the inhabitants of Kuldara again. Apart from tourists, almost no one comes here. The locals are sure that the village is cursed and is the center of paranormal activity. If you ask residents of other nearby towns or read the information on the internet, you'll learn a couple of legends about this place. One popular version says that people left this village because of a lack of water. However, this version doesn't explain why the residents did it overnight and left their things behind. According to another version, the villagers ran away to save the daughter of the Kuldara chief. One local ruler fell in love with her and wanted to marry her. He threatened the locals with grave consequences if the girl rejected him. The ruler gave them one day to make a decision. The residents disagreed with such a requirement. As a sign of solidarity, they decided to leave the village together with the chief and his daughter. But if this is true, why did no one else see these people? They must have escaped to another settlement. In addition, they needed their things on the way there. The stories of Kuldara and Lake Anjakuni have one thing in common. People left a comfortable and safe place for an unknown reason. A similar story happened in Ireland with a small village on the island of Ackle. About 40 simple houses made of stone and straw were located along the valley of Keem Bay. The village was mentioned in documents dated back to the 1830s as a group of small buildings. But today, there's practically nothing left of it, except pieces of walls and small mounds of ground. People from other settlements don't remember this village, but we know about it thanks to the records of travel writers. They describe the incredible beauty of this place and the village in their diaries. Students of the local archaeological school tried to find the answers. They started excavations and discovered that the villagers could have left the village because of hunger or some disease. More than 25 million people boarded cruise ships globally back in 2017. It may not seem like a lot, but that's more than the total population of Belgium. It's a great vacation alternative with an added bonus. 
you can sample various different destinations for future time off in one single trip. If you've already booked a trip on a cruise ship, but you still have no idea what you should pack, start with some research on your specific cruise location. Either way, be sure to bring deck-friendly shoes that are low-heeled. Also, add a pair that's comfortable to walk on larger distances for the days spent ashore. Depending on the season, you might want to add a few swimsuits too. If you're on any type of medication, make sure you bring it with you in its original packaging. If you're a light packer, don't worry. Most cruise ships come equipped with laundry rooms. They're kind of pricey, especially if you want your garments to be washed, ironed, and folded for you. But it does save you the extra hassle of packing more clothes or washing them for yourself. It's really important that you check in with your credit card company before boarding a ship, more so if your itinerary includes one or more foreign countries. Your credit card might get frozen if there's any unusual activity on your account. Most of these companies have algorithms that get triggered once there are charges from different countries in rapid succession, which is exactly what you'll be doing on a cruise ship. Letting them know beforehand saves you the embarrassment of having your card declined at some fancy restaurant. To make sure you get the best room, before booking it, check out the ship's deck plan. It should be available on their website. If it's peace and tranquility you're looking for, don't go for the rooms directly above or below any of the ship's entertainment points. Also, if you have a history of getting seasick, try to skip the rooms that are available at the front of the ship. Rather, go for those located in the middle of the ship on a lower deck. You'll feel less movement. If it's your first time going on a cruise, you might be surprised to know that some cabin rooms don't have windows. Before making a reservation, make sure to check out all the amenities of the room you intend to book. Most cruise liners add a bunch of pictures from the common rooms on the reservation pages, and it might be a bit confusing as to what you're getting exactly for that specific price point. Also, some rooms on board are quite small too. If you don't like to sleep in small spaces, you might want to upgrade to a larger room, even if it's a bit pricier. You can always split the cost with a friend if they want to join you on the cruise. With the help of modern technology, even if a specific location doesn't have windows, it doesn't mean you can't watch the waves. How, you might ask? Fancier cruise ships feature a secret added bonus. In the areas with no access to sunlight, specialists have built virtual balconies. These high-tech screens work by showing you what's going on outside in real time. They have an added benefit too. In case of bad weather, guests can still have a feel of the outdoors without the wind or rain ruining their hair or their outfit. It may not be the real deal, but it still beats getting claustrophobic on board. Planning on going on a budget cruise? It might not be such a bad idea, especially if you're on the lookout for last minute upgrades. You might even end up vacationing like a millionaire without having to spend money like one. These upgrades sometimes include things like a private balcony in your room, maybe some spa services, or even better prices for high-end meals. If they aren't all booked by the time people board the ship, they might be open for the rest of the passengers for way better prices than initially listed. There might be hidden freebies on board if you pay close attention. Things like complimentary pastries on board late in the morning or a late night cup of tea on the house might be some of the things offered to guests. You only need to ask. You might want to check out what other tourists are doing. Some people with more experience cruising can offer pretty great tips and tricks. Don't be afraid to start a conversation if you see someone getting something for free. Some cruise ships do go all the way on the fancy dial. They even have exclusive areas designed for guests staying in expensive suites. Most of the time, they're located at the top of the ship. On one particular cruise, these types of guests have designated staff members called Royal Genies, which are similar to butlers. They can cater to just a few cabins. Since the cruise line wants to divert other guests from asking them various questions, which will take time away from their assigned guests, the genies do not wear a name tag in public areas. Most common areas of cruise ships do require travelers to follow a dress code, 
but if you do your research in advance, you might find that some areas are more relaxed when it comes to what people need to wear. Most cruise ships require people to adhere to smart attire, which means pants with a collared shirt for men, or blouses and skirts, dresses, or stylish pants for the ladies. As for the travel destinations, be sure to research the ports you're about to visit in advance. You'll know what to wear, what the weather will be, and if you need to pack anything else. Like an umbrella or a beach towel. Stops on cruises only last for a few hours in most cases, so you'll want to get the most out of them. If that specific location includes museums or art galleries you want to add to your checklist, be sure to book in advance so you don't waste time waiting in lines. Some cruise ships even provide their guests with private tours of the ports they're about to visit. Do make sure to book them in advance if this is something you might be interested in, as the list gets pretty full quite fast. Independent tours are a bit more private. You can spend time with your tour guide and even ask more questions. Always remember to put your phone in airplane mode while on board. Most cruise ship horror stories involve cruising newbies that ended up paying thousands of dollars in cell phone charges while on ships just because they forgot to turn it off. If you're the type of person that can't switch off their phone, be sure to check with your cell phone provider before traveling internationally. Some can provide special plans for limited amounts of time without extra charges. You'll be free to chat, call, or browse YouTube videos without worrying you'll end up paying a fortune. Most cruise ships also provide you with complimentary Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi packages that can be purchased in advance, which are way more affordable. You can stick to communicating with your friends and family back home via FaceTime or Skype. People that have heard about the Titanic tragedy will always wonder what might happen if something goes wrong while on board. Let's take lifeboats, for instance. The Titanic had a mere 20 lifeboats on board which were tragically not enough to fit all the passengers after the ship hit the iceberg. Some fancy cruise ships these days have an even lower number of lifeboats, anywhere from 15 to 18. Sounds strange? Well, not really, given the fact that each lifeboat can accommodate up to 370 people. Even the largest ships, which have an estimated capacity of 8,000 people if fully booked, including tourists and staff, are safe in case of an emergency. So, imagine you're 15 and you get bored of playing video games. Instead, to pass the time, you decide to give some attention to an old hobby of yours, tracking down lost Mayan cities. You've heard that some ancient civilizations are said to have built entire cities based on constellations, so you decide to check out whether that was true for the Mayans. You find a book containing all the constellations the Mayan civilization believed to exist. You open good old Google Maps and map every ancient Mayan city discovered today. You start seeing that this information actually matches. And truly, the biggest ancient Mayan cities correspond to the brightest and biggest stars of the Mayan constellations. Okay, this is getting interesting. You manage to map out over 100 ancient cities when you suddenly notice something strange. There's an area in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico where archaeologists have unearthed two Mayan cities. But on the constellation map, there are three stars. Could this mean there is a long-lost city waiting to be discovered nearby? You might think this sounds too daydreamy, but the story is actually true. The previous account happened to a Canadian teenager named William Gaddery. The boy is known as a science genius and had even won an award for the constellation theory we presented just now. When he noticed that a third city was missing from the 23rd constellation he was examining, he began to scour the internet for satellite pictures that could help him solve this mystery. He looked into images from NASA, JAXA, a Japan-based satellite company, and Google Earth. These images were still insufficient to answer his questions, so he reached out to a friend inside the Canadian Space Agency. His friend provided him with state-of-the-art satellite imagery that gave him the answer he was looking for. According to the images, there is a large square area right on the border of Mexico and Belize which looks like the remains of a city. 
William took the images to a remote sensing expert known as Dr. Armin LaRogue from the University of New Brunswick. They studied the images thoroughly and concluded that the area could be housing 30 buildings and even a large pyramid. The scientific and archaeological community went crazy with the 15-year-old's discovery. Could this really be true? Some background. Lost Mayan cities began to be unearthed in the mid-20th century. Since then, ruins from cities such as Tikal, Palenik, and Uxmal have been rediscovered. The Mayans were one of the biggest pre-Columbian civilizations living in the Americas. They began to settle in the area as early as 1500 BCE. Experts believe that, at its height, the Mayan civilization consisted of over 40 cities with a population of millions of people. That's a crowd. And their cities were pretty interesting. Their civilization spanned over Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, Guatemala, and Belize. They survived mainly on agriculture, so they developed a complex irrigation system in most of their cities. They built a series of ceremonial buildings, pyramids, plazas, and even courts for ball games. The Mayans were keen pyramid builders, but they also developed an advanced astronomical system. With whatever ancient technology they had, they were able to predict the exact location of planets, such as Venus and Mars, and they were able to predict the exact dates of eclipses. That's why the methodology William used to discover this long-lost Mayan city was unusual, but not completely surreal. The Mayans were keen astronomers, so it wouldn't be too strange that they built their major architectural feats in relation to the sky, would it? And they wouldn't be the first ones to be doing so. There is a famous fringe of Egyptology dedicated to studying how the Giza pyramids were built in perfect alignment with the Orion constellation, meaning that each pyramid was purposely built to align with one of the major stars of Orion's belt. According to William, he first had the idea to look at the Mayan constellations because he couldn't understand why the Mayans built their cities where they built them. Most major cities, such as Chichen Itza and Uxmal, aren't near any rivers or significant bodies of water. Instead, they're built on marginal lands and on top of mountains, which confused the 15-year-old. His next thought was that it might have something to do with astronomy. William named the new city he discovered Mouth of Fire, which is also my nickname, and he even won a merit award for his hard work. However, his theory was very much contested inside the archaeological community, and many Mayan experts worked to debunk William's findings. Some archaeologists say that constellation theories are too unscientific. Anthony Aveni, a renowned anthropologist and astronomer, referred to William's methodology as an act of creative imagination. He explained that there is no way to be sure what the Mayan constellations really were, it's all just hypothetical. Another debunking of William's findings came from Mayanist David Stewart, who said that the object identified on the satellite imagery is nothing but an old cornfield. His claim was supported by an expedition that took place near the area in 2021, when the archaeologists present reported there was nothing at all in this area. Still, a 15-year-old boy almost found a long-lost Mayan city, which is pretty exciting if you ask me. Similar techniques as those used by William are actually being used to unearth lost civilizations all over the world. According to space archaeologist Sarah Parquet, satellite imagery has been a key player in discovering ancient cities in Egypt and other places. Sarah herself spends most of her days scouring images for any sign of where there could have been cities long ago. What happens, she says, is that any time you have something buried, it's going to be covered either by vegetation, soil or sand, or some other modern construction on top of it. In order to assess whether there is something hidden under large canopies of vegetation or not, she uses infrared technology, for instance. A major recent discovery in Brazil was done in a similar way. Satellite imagery detected a network of trenches dating back to 200 to 1200 CE. These suggest settlements that could have supported around 60,000 people. But in this case, the satellite imagery did indeed correspond to what was on the ground. Researchers from the University of Florida found several mounds that were accompanied by ditches and geoglyphs. Archaeologists also found remnants of carefully designed walls, 
centered around plazas, much like the type of construction done by the ancient Mayans. Advances in satellite tech have also shed new light on long-discovered ancient Mayan cities, such as Tikal. Located in the heart of the Guatemalan jungle, Tikal is believed to have been the capital of the ancient Mayan empire. At its height, it was comparable in importance to cities such as London or New York in today's world. It was composed of a series of complex monuments, many of them believed to have been the resting places of kings and chiefs. Tikal is already known to have been big, but recent discoveries show it could have been even three times larger than what scientists originally believed. The main discovery revolves around a fortification on the outskirts of the city, indicating how far the original city stretched. And new discoveries still take place. In 2017, researchers also unearthed new clues regarding the potential causes of the decline of the Mayan civilization. Using data from a site in Siwol, located 62 miles southwest of Tikal, scientists analyzed radiocarbon data from ceramics and archaeological excavations to extract new information about the sudden demise of this great civilization. The information shows that, instead of a sudden collapse, the Mayans most likely collapsed in waves of social instability and political crises. These events are believed to have deteriorated Mayan city centers and began causing the dispersion of the Mayan population. Well, it seems like it's a prime time to uncover ancient ruins. What do you say? Will you give it a try as well? Now, if you could get into a time machine and travel back to 1969, you'd see something spectacular. What you're looking at isn't some random desert. It's one of the most powerful waterfalls, completely dry. In the summer and fall of 1969, the American side of Niagara Falls stayed without water. It lasted six months. Researchers wanted to study the rock face of the falls. They were afraid it was going to become too unstable because of erosion. Erosion is the process when natural forces, such as water and wind, wear away earthen materials. For example, if you see glacial ice become muddy, it means erosion is happening. Three waterfalls that cross the international border between Canada and the United States together make something we know as the magnificent Niagara Falls. The three waterfalls are the Horseshoe Falls, the American Falls, and the Bridal Veil Falls, in order from largest to smallest. The American Falls are fully on the American side, while the Horseshoe Falls are primarily on the Canadian side, divided by Goat Island. The Bridal Veil Falls, the smallest of them all, are on the American side, but separated from the others by Luna Island. Don't America and Canada have a cool natural border? Many didn't believe we could actually go against wild nature and stop such insane amounts of water from flowing. But we did it! It took a 600-foot dam across the enormous Niagara River to really shut down these astonishing falls. This means they had to divert 60,000 gallons of water every second so that the remaining flow traveled over the biggest horseshoe falls, yup, the ones that are completely on the Canadian side of the border. Over 27,000 tons of rock were used to construct that dam, and more than 1,000 trucks carried that rock back in the hot summer of 69. On June 12, the American Falls stopped after their continuous flow for more than 12,000 years. So the horseshoe falls then took the extra flow and absorbed it so that research could be done. But the locals were still worried. They knew it wasn't possible to control such amounts of water. They were afraid the water might take a different route and cause a catastrophic flood. They were worried that tourists wouldn't come anymore if teams didn't manage to make the waterfall flow again the way it used to. But tourists kept coming even that summer, and they got a unique chance to see something no one had ever seen before or after. During that period, there was even a temporary walkway built only 20 feet away from the edge of the now-dry falls. It helped workers to clean the bottom of what used to be a river. So tourists could go there and explore the wild landscape of the falls that was usually under the water, hostile, and not accessible to visitors at all. As they were exploring the dried bottom of the falls, researchers stumbled upon millions of different coins people had thrown in the water over decades, maybe to make a wish or for some other purpose. Wow, a Niagara Falls piggy bank! Well, they removed most of those coins. I wonder who got them. But in the past couple of decades, more and more tourists have been coming here. Imagine all the things they could find now 
More coins, of course, but also lost cameras, errant drones, cell phones, and other things careless visitors could accidentally drop in the waterfalls. The idea of removing all the water and turning Niagara Falls into a desert proved to be possible. But it may need to be done again. In 2020, the media reported that two pedestrian bridges in Niagara Falls needed to be either replaced or repaired. No wonder, since they're almost 120 years old. These bridges are located above the rapids. Experts discuss whether they should divert the water once again or not. People talk about Niagara Falls a lot, and some believe they're among the tallest waterfalls in the world. But the truth is, they're not. They're famous, precious, and breathtaking. But when it comes to height, there are nearly 500 other waterfalls across the globe that are taller than Niagara. Let's take Angel Falls in Venezuela, for example. They're more than 3,000 feet tall. But what makes Niagara Falls so special, among other waterfalls, is the amount of water that flows over them. Very high waterfalls don't usually have great amounts of water. The combination of all those huge amounts of water and the height is what makes Niagara Falls so breathtaking. Also, they might be some of the fastest-moving waterfalls on our planet. The Niagara River appeared after the last ice age, together with the whole Great Lakes Basin. The Niagara River is part of it. 18,000 years ago, I wasn't around then, this awesome waterfall didn't exist. Ice sheets covered the area of southern Ontario. They were 1 to 2 miles thick. As the ice sheets were moving southward, they created the basin of the Great Lakes. Then they melted, releasing enormous amounts of water into the basins. Generally, the water we drink is fossil water. Only 1% of it renews through the year, with the remaining 99% coming from ice sheets. The Niagara Peninsula hasn't been beneath the ice for nearly 12,500 years. As the ice melted, the resulting water started to flow down through what later turned into Niagara River, Lake Erie, and Lake Ontario. It took a lot of time, but the water eventually eroded cliffs and formed these spectacular falls. Now, you might have noticed that the Niagara River is amazingly green. This specific color tells us how powerful the water is when it comes to erosion. Every minute, Niagara Falls spews over 60 tons of dissolved minerals. All that, together with dissolved salt and finely ground rock, makes the color so magnificent. People who live in the United States and Canada, or more precisely, over a million people who have access to the area, use the waters of Niagara River for different purposes. For example, fishing, getting drinking water, doing recreational activities, including swimming, boating, and bird watching, producing hydroelectric power, and so much more. Now, the first hydroelectric generating station in the world was built at the end of the 19th century, and it was right next to the falls. Pretty soon, it started paying off because people were getting electricity from it. But this electricity could travel only 300 feet, so something needed to be improved there. Nikola Tesla was the one who took up the challenge and made the necessary changes. He discovered that electricity could travel long distances if an alternating current was used. Today, several Niagara Falls power plants provide over 2 million kilowatts of power. Okay, I'll tell you another interesting thing. 1969 wasn't the only time when Niagara Falls stopped. Back in 1848, the water didn't flow over the falls for up to 40 hours. Now, the falls were already very popular among tourists and a useful source of energy for local people. So, no wonder they freaked out. Nature was to blame this time. Ice blocked the source of the Niagara River. An American farmer was the first one to notice it. It was March 29th, and he went for a walk right before midnight. Soon, he realized he couldn't hear the powerful roar of the falls. He quickly went to the edge of the river and stood there in shock. There was hardly any water. Factories and mills had to shut down because they depended on that water. Turtles were just wandering around. Fish didn't survive. Some people took a walk on the river bottom, taking little things they could find there as souvenirs. But two days later, on March 31st, people heard a distant rumbling coming from upriver. It was getting nearer and louder until a wall of water appeared in front of their eyes. And one of the world's greatest attractions that millions of tourists visit every year was back in business again. Magnificent and, in the end, invincible. As it should be. So you found your first gray hair, and you have a huge desire to pull it out and keep it as a souvenir. 
but the all-knowing grandma stops you from doing that since everybody knows two new hairs will grow in its place. It's one of the most popular myths that have been going around for years. When you pluck out a hair, the follicle still stays where it was and it will produce a substitute soon enough. But it doesn't have the superpower to multiply, so you'll get just one new grey hair. The new hair might even be darker, as the hair follicle might produce another pigment this time. If you go too far with plucking, though, you might no longer have any hair in that very spot. Are you afraid of using your cell phone at the gas pump, because it might cause an explosion? Well, there hasn't been a single documented case of a phone given off a static electrical charge and causing a tragedy. All the no cell phone signs at gas stations are a precaution. Electronic materials aren't welcome there, because they might cause static electricity and be a source of danger. Plus, you should be 100% alert whenever you're driving. Chatting or texting while fueling up might cause some bad consequences, like driving away with a gas pump in your car. A viral video made millions of people believe that if you see a wire tied to your car door handle, you gotta call the police immediately. According to the author, kidnappers use this trick to distract you and then go after you. In reality, there have been no officially recorded cases of anyone getting kidnapped this way. This urban legend must come from a 2015 Facebook post, which mentioned the wire trick and was debunked soon after it came out. The idea lived on, though, and keeps resurfacing. It does make sense to look after yourself and follow some simple rules that will let you stay safe on the road anyway. You might want to learn some self-defense, park in well-lit areas, and always look around for suspicious things and people before you get in the car. Also remember that a lot of similar myths and urban legends are only created to grab your attention and get their authors some likes and shares. If you add brown sugar to your coffee, confident that it's healthier than the white option, it's probably not the best idea. Brown sugar does contain some minerals, but the amount of them is so tiny that it can't really benefit your health. Otherwise, it has the same amount of calories and nutritional value as the white sugar. The only difference is in color, flavor and the manufacturing process. Brown sugar doesn't go through that much chemical processing. So if you're trying to cut your calories, it doesn't really matter which of the sugar types you add to your food. When you press the snooze button in the morning, you're not actually going to get those extra 10 minutes of sleep. It does feel good to postpone getting up, but the snooze button makes you feel more tired instead of providing you with extra rest. You have your own biological sleep cycle that adjusts to your schedule. When you wake up and instantly fall asleep again, your brain gets confused, which is why it will get harder and harder for you to get up when the alarm rings for the second or fifth time. In the long run, the snooze button may mess with your ability to get high-quality deep sleep. Another popular sleep myth is that you swallow up eight spiders every night without knowing. Relax, you don't swallow any spiders at all. To them you look like a giant, or rather a mountain in the landscape. Any sounds you produce while sleeping, like breathing or your heartbeat, are super scary to them. So all they want to do is stay as far away from you as they can. This myth went global after a magazine article that mentioned people easily believe anything they see online. Well, the article was right after all. You don't really have to wait 30 minutes or longer to swim after lunch. This myth has been around for more than a century, as it was a rule published in the 1908 Boy Scout Handbook. It said that swimming sooner than 90 minutes after food could lead to very dangerous consequences. It made many people believe that because digestion diverts blood flow from the muscles to the stomach, swimming could prevent the blood flow to the stomach, give you cramps and even make you drown. In reality, extra blood goes to the stomach, but it doesn't affect your arms or legs. Food might even be good for your swim, as it will provide you with extra energy. And don't forget to take enough water with it to stay hydrated. Diamonds are super expensive because they're so rare, right? 
It turns out they aren't as rare as we're made to believe. Rubies, emeralds and sapphires are much rarer and far more expensive than diamonds. Scientists have even found a way to create artificial diamonds, making their production rather easy. So that price people are willing to pay is a result of a super successful marketing campaign from over a century ago. The company that mined and sold diamonds spread myths about these gems around the world. They convinced everyone on the planet that diamonds are so rare that the price is reasonable. Plus, they've turned these rocks into a symbol of love and engagement. Movies made us believe all dinosaurs were huge, dangerous lizards. But in reality, there were all kinds of dino species. Some of them weren't much bigger than a cat or a golden retriever. It looks like those smaller species were more numerous than their big relatives. Plus, some dinos, like T-Rex, were even covered with feathers, especially in the early stages of their lives. The deeper you go inside the ocean, the darker it gets until there is no light at all. The colors change from blue-green close the surface to more intense blues and then down to indigo blue and total blackness. Well, sunlight penetrates deep waters weekly, so technically below 3200 feet there is officially no light. But there is another type of light down there. It's all about blue and green luminescence. It generates light thanks to an enzyme called luciferase. It breaks down high-energy molecules and produces photons in bacteria and some deep-sea fish bodies. It seems logical that summers are so warm because our planet gets closer to the sun and winters are so cold because the Earth gets as far from our star as it can be. Yet, it's another popular myth. When it's summer in the northern hemisphere, our planet isn't actually closer to the sun. It's the opposite. The Earth is at its farthest point from the sun during July and at its closest point during January. Summer is warm because the axis of our planet is tilted. During its orbit, the Earth's tilt allows energy coming from the Sun to hit us more directly, because the angle is steeper. The asteroid belt isn't as dangerous as Blockbuster made us believe. If you were to travel through, it wouldn't be a flight through a dense and chaotic field of rocks smashing into each other. The asteroid belt is a zone that's 200 million or 300 million miles away from the Sun. It's a very isolated and lonely void with much space in between. If you pulled all those asteroids from that belt together, you'd get a mass that's around 4% of our moon. That's why astronauts get really excited when they see just one asteroid smashing into another one. Otherwise, space is not that eventful. Flies are everywhere we go, literally. It's believed that flies originated in Asia, but these days, they live everywhere people live, only excluding Antarctica and maybe a couple of islands. Flies have traveled the oceans following humans, but they never go anywhere alone. In the wilderness and deserts where humans are absent, you won't find any flies. We know them well, but we all have that unanswered question about flies. Why do flies rub their limbs? Turns out, they just clean them. It's this simple. A fly has hair all over its body. The hairs on the limbs serve as detectors for flying, finding food, and doing whatever else the fly business is. They have to keep their limbs clean at all times. So, they just rub them every time they get a chance. Their limbs are sensitive, and they serve more than one purpose. Apparently, the limbs have taste receptors, so the flies can taste with their feet. They can land on their potential meal and wander around it, giving it a good taste before consuming it. Flies can't chew, so they're on an all-liquid diet and drink their food. If the food they have picked as their next meal is solid, they have a special ritual to make it edible. A fly regurgitates digestive juices on their soon-to-be food, and those juices break it into the smallest pieces that can be drunk. Also, spitting out those juices frees up space in their stomachs for new food. Quite often, flies sit on our food. They can appear harmless, but it's not exactly true. First, remember that they spill out those juices onto your food. 
which is already gross enough. But there's more. You have to keep in mind that flies land everywhere, and it's not always flowers, but all the gross stuff as well. And flies especially like that said gross stuff, like rotting foods, dumpsters, and even worse. So, their limbs collect all the germs and microbes from those places. When a fly lands on your food, it transfers those germs to your meal. Some of the microbes they transfer can even cause diseases like cholera and typhoid. There was even an experiment once made to demonstrate how it works. There were two bowls. One contained a red powder of some kind of spice and the other bowl had white rice in it. Flies were let in and they would migrate from the spice bowl to the rice bowl and back. Soon enough, rice got covered with red spice. Now replace harmless spice with something grosser and rice with your dinner. So you should always cover your food to make sure some fly doesn't take a walk on it and step and spit all over it. If you're eating, make sure you swat them away. But don't worry if some annoying fly manages to sit on your sandwich for a second before you kick it out. No need to throw the sandwich out. If you acted fast, then you're safe. Also, experts say that an average healthy human has a strong enough immune system to repel parasites. Even though flies are gross and annoying, bugging around and tickling you with their limbs, they do serve some good. They're responsible for pollinating flowers. They collect nectar from them, which gets stuck to their hair on their bodies. And then they pollinate the next flower when landing on it. Also, if flies didn't exist, our planet would be even dirtier. Flies recycle some of the human waste. Flies are also an important part of the ecosystem since they're food for birds, spiders, lizards, frogs, and many more. Without flies, they'd all go extinct. Apart from flies having the superpower of tasting with their feet, there are other interesting facts about them too. They can walk on both horizontal and vertical surfaces and even upside down. They can do it because each one of a fly's feet has two pads with tiny hair. And those hairs produce a glue-like substance that allows flies to have an excellent grip. Flies have unique eyes, which have a large complex of 3,000 to 6,000 simpler eyes within each of the two compound eyes. A fly's eyes don't move, but its vision is nearly 360 degrees. They can see behind their back. So, wherever you are, a fly definitely sees you and every other danger with one or a few of their thousands of monitors. In addition to the two compound eyes, flies also have three simple eyes located on their foreheads, which serve as a compass and allow a fly to navigate. They also have an amazing reaction time. Ever wondered why it's so hard to swat a fly? Well, to a fly, we're sloths. That's because they see things in slow motion compared to us. Species have different perceptions of speed. The speed we see will be twice faster for a turtle and it will be four times slower for a fly. Turn a video on at 0.25 times speed and imagine someone approaching you with this speed. Well, that's how a fly sees you. So yes, it has enough time to escape a fly has just one set of wings, but in addition to their pair of wings, they also have so-called halters, which allow them to take off fast. Millions of years ago, halters were serving as a second pair of wings. Now they help to take off and also to balance the air. If a fly loses one of the halters, it'll start flying in circles. And if both of them go missing, it won't be able to fly anymore at all. Also, even though their wings beat up to 1,000 times per minute, they're also very slow flyers, only reaching the speed of 4.5 miles per hour. If a fly lives in an urban area with enough people and garbage around, it doesn't fly far away from the place of residence, only having a territory of a bit over 3,200 feet. Rural flies are far more explorative, and they can fly away up to seven miles at a time. A fly doesn't live long. Its lifetime is just around 30 days. But during this time, they lay from 500 to 800 eggs each on average. But it's not 1,000 at once. It's several goes throughout their life. With 75 to 100 eggs at once, 
the eggs hatch within 24 hours. And it takes a week in total for an egg to turn into a grown fly. And then the cycle continues. In colder climates, this process can take twice as long. A timber fly is the biggest fly species, which lives in Central and South America. They can grow up to 3.15 inches. Also, flies have beds, or more like their favorite spot to stay and sleep. They have a comfy place, somewhere close to their source of food, and they come there to rest at night. If you ever had your house flooded with flies, here are a few tips for you to reduce their population. First, it's important to understand what they're attracted to. They're attracted to other flies and even to the smell of flies living there. And flies have an amazing sense of smell. So if you hosted even one fly, expect to get more guests. If you have any traces of flies, like fly specks, they'll find you too. Make sure to wash your walls and surfaces. Next, flies love garbage and rotting produce. They lay eggs in rotten food and meat, so make sure to keep your food in the fridge, cover it, and keep the trash in tightly sealed containers. And of course, take out the trash regularly. Flies have a sweet tooth, or more like a sweet foot, since they taste with their feet. And they love syrup and other sugary liquids. They're also fond of soda and vinegar. So make sure to keep those stored and always wipe after yourself if you spill something. Lastly, they like to hide and live in dirty and leaky drains. They eat the bacteria from there. So always clear your drains and repair any leaks right away. Also, it'll help to seal all the cracks in your floor, ceiling, and walls if you have any. That's one of their ways to get into the house. Well, looky here. It's New York City, the Big Apple, the city that never sleeps, Hong Kong on the Hudson, the greatest city in the world, New York, New York, the city so nice they named it twice. All right, I'll stop. You thought you knew this city so well, but underneath all that glitz and glamour is a facade, literally. New York is populated with some of the most iconic urban buildings in the world and home to some of the most unique and famous towers. Who would have known that New York was a front for fake buildings? And the cool thing is that there are plenty to search for. Okay, I'm adding that to my bucket list. So the question is, why do they put these fake buildings all over New York? The city is one of the most vibrant places in the world and requires many infrastructures to keep the city in motion. That means having many industrial structures and buildings in every major district. New York is charming for the design and the buildings. Imagine having industrial structures right next to your favorite pizza parlor or hot dog stand. The designers thought ahead and decided to disguise those industrial infrastructures as fake buildings. They blend with the city so well that they don't stand out. They look like your good old apartment or housing unit with a front door, real-life windows, and even charming balconies where people would hang out. The only thing is that there's nothing behind the facade and no one is allowed inside. So where in the world can you find these fake buildings? For starters, one of the most popular fake buildings is in Brooklyn. At 58 Giralamont Street, you can find a very typical neighborhood. But between the buildings stands a brick building with a slightly deeper shade than the rest. It has bright open windows that blend in with the rest of the buildings in the neighborhood, except that they're blacked out. At first glance, you might not think of it as anything. But if you pay close attention, the building looks like a glitch from a video game. It was built in 1847, way before New York was considered glamorous. Originally, it was meant to be a regular building, but in 1908, they converted it into a fake building. Don't think you can just try to break in. Even if you could, it's pointless, because it's part of a ventilation fan for the subway. It also serves as an emergency exit for some of the surrounding buildings. Actually, throughout New York, many fake buildings exist to disguise the subway vents for the smoke to escape. All the way to 415 Bruckner Boulevard, the Bronx, this townhouse was designed by the Switzer Group, which is an interior architect company. It's not as charming as the one at 58 Jorah Lemon Street, but it serves a similar purpose – to hide an electric substation for New York's utility company. The city needs these substations to reduce the high-voltage electricity to a lower voltage so it can be distributed locally. 
Having a building like this popping out of the middle of your neighborhood isn't exactly the smartest way to attract people to the Bronx. That's why the fake townhouse facade is the perfect camouflage. Now, some of these fake buildings don't really hit the mark and stick out like a sore thumb. The people of Manhattan described the Mulry Square infrastructure as a complete clunker. After plenty of redesigns and back to the drawing board meetings, the result is still not pretty. The locals compare it to a concrete box. They created windows without glass, which doesn't allow the building to blend in with the rest of the neighborhood. But it beats a typical subway ventilation plant either way. There are just so many places to visit and cross off your bucket list. But if you live in China, you can literally stay in the country and visit many iconic cities around the world. The replica cities began when the Chinese economy started booming in the early 90s. They wanted the lifestyle of the rich and famous without wanting to leave their country. They can be comfortable eating their local food and get the feeling of being abroad. The Chinese province of Guangdong has an identical copy of the historical Australian alpine village Hallstatt. The real Hallstatt is centuries old and one of the most charming places to discover. The local people of Hallstatt also had no idea that their home was being built in China. Some people thought that this was controversial, probably because it cost around $940 million to build it. Paris is undoubtedly one of the most charming cities you could ever visit. Its rich history and vibrant culture are enough to catch the first plane to go there. For residents of Tian du Cheng, that's something they can do anytime they want. The city is also known as Sky City and has a replica of the Eiffel Tower that looks eerily like the iconic one in Paris and built buildings to match the city's visual charm. One of the main things that will break the charm is the farmland surrounding the city. There's barely anyone there, and the streets are always empty, very un-Paris-like. Still, you can find some nice fountains and statues scattered along the streets to give it some spirit. There's laundry hung everywhere, even on the trees. The picturesque fountains are dry and many apartments are empty. Only a few stores are open for business. Even though this looks like a fake city, it's quite real. Some people live here because it's more affordable than other places. Two hours away from this town is another version of Paris's Pont Alexandre III and a carbon copy of London's Tower Bridge, but with four towers instead of two. Hey, such a bargain! You can also visit the closest thing to Italy, but this time you can go shopping. Florentia Village is an outlet mall that offers an array of shops to lose yourself. The good thing is that this was built by an Italian developer to capture the essence of an Italian village. It has fountains, canals, and mosaics for proper aesthetics. It began in 2011 and has more than 200 shops with many Italian brands and British, US, and Chinese brands as well. The place is so popular that it gets between 10,000 and 25,000 visitors per day. China also has other replica towns that put you in a mini Manhattan called the Yu Jiapu Financial District. The developer's goal was to make this place the financial center of the world. It was complete with the right landmarks, like the Rockefeller and Lincoln Centers, but the project was halted in 2019, leaving it mainly empty. You can find a typical English town with cobbled streets, Victorian homes, and restaurants that make Thames Town. This place was meant to recreate a European lifestyle fantasy without leaving Shanghai. China also has a Dutch town that has some elements of Amsterdam with windmills and famous canals. They even decided to copy some of the landmarks, like the Netherlands Maritime Museum. Here's a bonus story of Lebanon's thinnest building built out of a dispute. It's the story of two brothers who both inherited unequal plots of land. One of the brothers happened to get a very thin plot of land and couldn't help but be jealous of his brother's nice plot of land. He wasn't pleased. Both of the lands overlooked the Mediterranean Sea in a lively neighborhood of Beirut. So it's no wonder that both brothers couldn't agree on how they should develop their lands. It was obvious that the brother with the most land could build a proper building. The other brother had to improvise. He decided to obstruct his brother's property by constructing a thin building enough to only fit 14 feet at its widest and 2 feet at its most narrow. It was constructed in 1954, and the locals of the area know it as the Grudge. 
The crazy thing is that the place was once habitable with many visitors enjoying their stay. It's not easy to live there, but it's part of living the experience. The building is still standing, but is empty. Welcome to Starbuck Island in the middle of the Pacific near French Polynesia. Even if the name brings to mind a strong coffee smell, you will find no Frappuccino there. The island is uninhabited. It's also pretty tiny, just 5.5 miles east to west and about 2 miles north to south. The island is so small, New York City could fit in 18 such islands. Seems like there can be zero interesting things, but… Google Maps have something to surprise you. A couple of months ago, there was a viral TikTok video about a weird saucer-shaped object found on Google Maps on Starbuck Island. The video racked up over 5 million views in two days. The creepiest part is that there's a long streak traversing almost the whole island. It looks as if someone had to break with all their might but failed, and it resulted in a crash of that saucer-looking vehicle. Could that be another possible proof that we aren't alone in the universe and someone tried to visit us and couldn't drive very well? All these speculations are blood-chilling, and the users believe no one knew the true story behind those traces and the saucer. Little did they know that back in 2009, a group of explorers visited the deserted island. They made a couple of videos that were uploaded to the net. Thing is, the island didn't used to be that deserted. In the 19th century, Starbuck Island was used for guano mining. A tiny clarification here, guano is bird and bat droppings. Yeah, droppings mining doesn't sound quite convincing. But guano is rich in phosphates, and phosphates have a lot of uses and can be used as fertilizers. So, since there were some people on that island, they had to construct a sort of temporary settlement, which they did. Now, back to Google Maps. Do you see that angle? Right. The satellite picture can be compared to the pictures and videos made in 2009 by the explorers. Another point proving that this weird object has a terrestrial origin is that there are some trees on the island, which is bizarre. These trees aren't native to coral limestone terrain, and they were definitely planted by people. Mystery solved! The saucer-shaped object is not an extraterrestrial vehicle, but what remains from a settlement. And the traces stretched out across the island? Eh, who knows? But it's definitely nothing out of this world. Another TikTok user claimed they saw zombies on Google Maps. Let's see if this one is true. First off, the video scared over a million people who watched it. This TikTok starts with a view from afar, and as the user zooms in, we understand we're in Finland. Then we see an inscription. Uh, Alright, I surrender. Finnish viewers, help me out here. The next thing we see is a low-quality Google Street View image, and that shot sends shivers down my spine. It looks like a mass gathering of people, but they don't look quite alive. The image looks foggy and bewildering. Are these real zombies? Sure thing they're not. First off, let's deal with the inscription. It translates to English as a quiet people spatial artwork by this person. So, he is a Finnish dancer and choreographer and intended the Silent People artwork to be part of his performance. But now it's an independent art piece. Fun fact, the Silent People figures get changed twice a year, in the fall and at the beginning of the summer. They get all the clothes from donations. Bang! Another myth debunked. Right side 2, TikTok myths 0. Right, now take a look at that pic. Anything weird you've noticed? Right, it's a three-legged girl. The satellite picture was taken in Croatia, but there's nothing to worry about. These are nothing but Google Maps issues. Thing is, the technology used for Google Maps purposes has a curious algorithm. Each object gets photographed several times, and then the resulting photos are stitched together to achieve the most accurate image. In most cases, it works, but sometimes it seems like the technology tries too hard and it results in extra details and sometimes extra limbs people have in the photo. And if we're going to have a three-legged race, then I'd bet on her. There's nothing that can escape the all-seeing satellite eye, right? On September 20th, 2022, a TikTok user posted a video about a plane found underwater on Google Earth app. The plane was found off the coast of Crooked Island in the Bahamas, 
not far away from Colonel Hill Airport. Now, let's see if that's true. The first thing we should keep in mind is that even Google Earth Help themselves admit the fact that the pic found in the app may be the result of several photos, either satellite or aerial, taken on different days and even in different months. The result of stitching might sometimes be a bit unpredictable. Remember the three-legged girl? How could we forget? So, as you may have already guessed, this photo is nothing but stitching. The area with that plane was photographed multiple times in 2004 and 2005, then it was photographed eight times in 2015 and a couple of times later. The most probable reason for this photo being on Google Earth is that these are the 2015 shots combined together. They say the reticulated python is the largest snake in the world and can reach a whopping 20 feet in length. There's a record of one such python found in 1912 that reached 32 feet in length. However, users found an even more staggering snake on Google Earth. On March 24, 2022, another mind-blowing video was posted on TikTok. The video got over 200,000 likes. Imagine the views! This time, the user claimed that a mega-skeleton of the extinct Titanoboa was found on Google Maps somewhere in France. It was hard to judge from the image, but the skeleton was estimated to be about 100 feet long and could have certainly been the longest snake that ever existed, if the snakes had had such a skeleton in reality. So it's the number one reason why this one is not a snake. You see, snakes have somewhat thinner ribs, and the skeleton in the picture looks way more massive. Another curious thing about this skeleton is that it turned out to be made of steel. See what I'm driving at? It's not a real skeleton, but a stunning 425-foot-long art installation. It's called this French name, which means ocean snake in French. The installation was created by a Chinese artist, Huang Yongping, and it's free to visit. The cool thing about this installation is that it only appears with tides, so it looks like a real archaeological excavation. Well, the artist made a monkey out of millions of users. If you ever travel to France, you can go check this extraordinary piece of art. It's located in this place, not far away from that place. Sometimes, Google Maps shows something that never existed. Meet Sandy Island. For a long time, it was believed to be located near New Caledonia in the Eastern Coral Sea. It all started when Captain James Cook included it in the charts back in 1774. He never visited it, but it was later included in several more charts as a precaution against reefs. At the time, it was standard practice. Plus, the area was, and is still, swarming with pumice sea rats. These are the masses left after an underwater volcanic eruption, so such a precaution was a necessity. This way, the island stayed in the charts until 1974. A flying recognition campaign claimed there was a lack of appearance of that island and Sandy Island was deleted from the charts. Google Maps appeared back in 2005, and the island, surprisingly, was there, even though it had been previously undiscovered. It got removed from Google Maps only in November of 2012. Now, there is nothing but black pixels, but there used to be a darkened sea area. Today, some specialists believe the whole situation with the island was just a copyright trap which was a popular practice among cartographers back in the day. Those traps help cartographers protect their intellectual property. So, have you ever seen anything weird 